Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And thank you for joining us today for a joint oversight hearing with the Committee on Public Housing on Senior Services and Centers in New York City Housing Authority, also known as NYCHA. I want to thank Chair Alika Ampri Samuels for co-chairing this hearing today. Research show that our city's older adult population is increasing rapidly. New York City's older adult population increased from 950,000 in 2005 to more than 1.1 million today, representing about 13% of New York City's total population. With the growing number of seniors in our city, it is vital that we provide the necessary resources and services to help them safely age in place. While older adults live in various places throughout the city, many of them live in NYCHA housing developments. In fact, about 20% of NYCHA residents are 62 or older. There are many services available to seniors in NYCHA, provided largely through NYCHA's collaboration with the Department for the Aging, DIFTA. For example, senior center and social clubs uh, of DIFTA's 249 senior center, 74 of them are in NYCHA. There are also 14 social clubs in NYCHA which offer smaller programs than general senior centers. Both senior centers and social clubs offer older adults the opportunity to participate in events such as health promotion and cultural activities. Unlike the majority of social clubs, however, senior centers provide congregate meals and more robust programming. Both are important way to address senior isolation by giving older adults a place to socialize with each other. Additionally, there are naturally occurring retirement communities, or NORC, in 11 NYCHA developments. NORCs provide supportive services to many older adults aging in place, including case management, health care assistance, information and referral services, and financial management. Despite the collaboration between DIFTA and NYCHA to serve our city's aging population, seniors in NYCHA housing, senior center, NORCs, and senior social club have faced and continue facing a variety of severe conditions that these agencies have failed to address. We have heard about NYCHA senior residents who live in apartments with leak, mold, and pests. Many of them live in high-rise buildings in which elevators have been broken for extensive period of time. When some of these residents visit senior centers in their development, they are exposed to dangerous conditions including moldy moldy ceilings, peeling paint, and sometimes even rats crawling out of holes. Some of these centers even lack heat during the freezing cold winters month and air conditioning during the scorching hot summer. Many of these senior centers are not even wheelchair accessible. This is not just unbelievable, it's unacceptable. While these conditions are concerning, what I find more alarming is the ineffectiveness interagency coordination between NYCHA and DIFTA when it comes to addressing such conditions. According to a 2017 audit report by Comptroller Scott Stringer, some NYCHA senior center providers have indicated that it often takes months and sometimes even years before NYCHA makes repairs in their facilities. One senior center reported that it has had the same broken window for five years, despite submitting multiple repair tickets to NYCHA, who is helping our seniors stay safe in their senior center and social club? At an October 2017 Council Aging Committee oversight hearing on senior center repairs and upgrades, DIFTA testified that NYCHA is responsible for addressing repairs and maintenance to the facilities, envelope, and building system, including roof leaks, sewage backup, and heating issues. 
The senior center providers, however, is, re is responsible for repairs inside of the program space in senior centers. The administration also testified that senior center providers submit tickets to NYCHA for repair work and that both agencies work closely together to complete repairs. Well, if these agencies are working together so closely, then why are there so many senior center that have had the same deficiencies for months and even years? I want to know what is preventing such repairs from getting resolved in a timely fashion. Further, I understand that DIFTA is transitioning away from serving as a direct service provider, transitioning to becoming a service coordinator. NYCHA has, as a result, created geographical zones that allow residents to receive access to services offered by community-based organizations in their neighborhood. However, this creates a burden on seniors who might not be able, who might not be mobile and might not be able to get to wherever their zone office is located. Seniors should get the help that they need where they live and not be referred somewhere else. I hope to hear more about NYCHA's zone models and its impact on senior living in Knox. NYCHA and DIFTA's lack of urgency on the living conditions on seniors is not only causing many of them stress, but is also hazardous to their health. At this hearing, I hope to hear more from the agencies about how they plan to improve their coordination in order to help improve the lives of NYCHA senior residents. I'd like to thank the committee staff for helping in putting together this hearing. Our counsel, Nusak Chaudhary, our policy uh, analyst, Kalima Johnson, and finance analyst, Daniel Krupp. And I'd like to thank the other member of the aging committee who have joined us here today. And we have joined by council member Drum and council member Rose. Um, now I'd like to turn the floor over to my uh, co-chair, council member Ampriel Samuel for some opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, council member Chen. And thank you all for coming to today's joint hearing on the committee on aging and the committee on public housing. I am Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee. Today, we will have the opportunity to discuss senior services and centers throughout NYCHA developments. Seniors are a core part of our city and a major part of the NYCHA community. One in five NYCHA residents are seniors, and almost 40% of NYCHA households are headed by people aged 62 and older. In my district alone, I am proud to represent the seniors who I see in the audience are um, a lot from my district just this morning, from Van Dyke Two, Brown, Reed Houses, Marcus Garvey, Kingsborough Extension, Saratoga Square, which are all senior-only buildings. And I visit the seniors often at 11 senior centers and senior clubs in my district at Van Dyke Two, Brown, Reed, Marcus Garvey, Kingsborough, Cephalo, Langston Hughes, Brownsville, Tilden, Saratoga, and Brevoid. And that list does not include the six other senior-only housing buildings in my district that are not on NYCHA grounds and are not contracted with DIFTA, and one we were recently able to secure NORC funding for. Because older adults have unique needs, it is clear that NYCHA and DIFTA must work together to allow seniors to live with the dignity they deserve. But how NYCHA and DIFTA work together is unfortunately today not so clear. Community advocates have told us that senior centers, social clubs, NORCs are not immune from the overarching issues that plague NYCHA, namely disorganization and disrepair. Residents who utilize the senior centers have complained of roaches, leaks, mold, inadequate heating in the winter, inadequate cooling in the summer, and a host of other issues. Worse still than the presence of such problems is the failure to address them. Just this past summer, 
Bree Voigt Social Club, and Tilden Senior Center were without working ACs, and the cost to repair Bree Voigt was only $1,500, and Tilden had to close on some days, although it's listed as a cooling center. It defies reason that it should take NYCHA years to complete basic repairs, but that is what was reported in the Comptroller's 2017 audit of senior centers. What we need to hear from NYCHA and DIFTA today is exactly how responsibilities are divided to ensure that repairs are completed in a timely fashion and how communication occurs between the agencies. Seniors need more than the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, and they definitely need more than neither hand performing at 100% at times. Additionally, the committees would like to hear more from the agencies about how fines are apportioned when there is an issue or a violation of a building code. Advocates have spoken out about community-based organizations being forced to raise money to pay for fines. I visited a senior center that had a fine of $5,000 and was forced to host fundraisers and bake sales to pay for debt caused by issues they had no control over. It does not make sense for a nonprofit to suffer shoddy building conditions when NYCHA has dollars, millions of dollars dedicated to renovations and repairs at community and senior centers. We need to know when and how NYCHA and DIFTA steps in in these cases. NYCHA and DIFTA must work together and work with us, the council, in order to effectively serve our senior population. I look forward to today's testimony and discussions with the agencies on how we can all do just that together. And now I turn it back to um, co-chair, council member Chen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we also been joined by council member Machaka earlier and he's on the public housing committee, right? And uh, council member Ren Bramer. Now we're gonna have um, our council um, swear in the first panel from uh, DIPTA. Okay, so we are gonna do uh, the public panel first. And we're gonna call up uh, Letitia Miller. Bethia from Sage mm -hmm. Senior Housing. Okay, uh, Gregory Morris from the Stanley Isaac Neighborhood Center and Lillian Wu from uh, the Hamilton Madison House Senior Center. Uh, please begin. Okay. Yeah, we ha we uh, have a five minute time clock, so please try to summarize and also some of the important points. And we want to make sure that uh, representative from DIFTA and NYCHA will be able to hear some of your concern and hopefully they can address some of them. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Council members, on behalf of SAGE, thank you for holding this hearing on senior services and NYCHA developments. My name is Leticia Malarpathia, and I am SAGE's Director of Residential Resident Services. SAGE is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older adults. Founded in New York City in 1978, we have provided comprehensive social services and programs to LGBT older older people for 40 years, including the nation's first full-time senior center, the Eddie Windsor Sage Center, located in Chelsea, Chelsea, and launched with generous support from the council. 
building on the positive strides that Sage, the SAGE Center has made in reducing isolation faced by LGBT older adults. In June of 2014, the New York City Council awarded SAGE funding to open SAGE Center's Center standalone sites in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Staten Island, and to expand our SAGE Harlem program into a full service SAGE Center site. And for that, we are enormously grateful. LGBT older people are a significant part of our city, city's rapidly growing elder population and are often severely isolated and disconnected from services. Extreme isolation and experience discrimination are a lethal combination for LGBT elders. A recent study found that the impact that isolation has on one's health, physical health, is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. More needs to be done to ensure our city's most isolated elders can find meaningful connection. In fact, LGBT elders are severely isolated. They are twice as likely to live alone, half as likely to be partnered, and four times less likely to have kids. Many LGBT elders were shunned by their families and as a result are half as likely to be close, to have close relatives to call for help. Roughly one quarter of LGBT elders have no one to call in the, in the case of an emergency. Because of their thin supports, LGBT elders often need to turn to service providers for care as they age, yet they're often distrustful of mainstream providers and for good reason. LGBT older adults are more likely to face discrimination around their sexual orientation and gender identity when accessing care, social services, and other programs. Discrimination has lasting effects on LGBT older adults' financial security. More than four in 10, 42% in fact of LGBT Americans over the age of 65 cite financial, financial problems as a major concern. Roughly 47% report having less than 10,000 in savings and assets, and 30% are concerned about their housing stability. 51% of LGBT older people report that they, are very, that they are very or extremely concerned about having enough money to live on compared to 36% of straight couples. The fact that so many LGBT elders are low income and struggle with financial security coupled with our city's rapidly rising older GP LGBT demographic will mean that more senior centers will likely need to be located near NYCHA housing campuses. Recognizing the acute need among our city's LGBT older adults and LGBT welcoming el for wel welcome, LGBT welcoming elder housing, SAGE and our partners, Help USA and BFC partners, are developing New York City's first LGBT welcoming senior housing in Brooklyn and the Bronx. The marquee of each development will be a full service ground floor SAGE center built on our, built on our success, built on our successful which will support building residents and, elder, and elders in larger communities in which each building is located. Both of these buildings are 100% affordable and each have a set aside for formerly homeless elders. The largest of these two buildings, Ingersoll Senior Residence, Residences, is part of the, of the Next Gen NYCHA initiative and is being built on NYCHA's Ingersoll Public Housing Campus. The services and programming offered through the co-located ground floor the SAGE Center will draw from our 40 years of experience of service provision to LGBT elders. Ingersoll Senior Housing house, uh, Senior Residences and its co-located SAGE Center will serve low-income building tenants as well as elders in the Fort Greene and surrounding neighborhoods. And is that my time? Uh yeah, why don't you continue? Uh, can you maybe sum up with the, the couple of uh, the repair issue okay. that you can highlight so that we can uh, try to get them addressed later? Um, okay. Um, in addition, in our experience, operating the uh, network of five senior centers across the city also means that providers assume much of the responsibility for the upkeep and maintenance of these sites, further stretches SAGE's budget. 
Our Harlem Sage Center located in the Drew Hamilton Community Center on which Sage leases from NYCHA. Sage experienced challenges this past summer when the ceiling at the site partially collapsed directly over the serving table from which we serve daily meals. It took a week for NYCHA to address the issue, which was which was likely due to Sage's outreach to the mayor's office. For over a week, there was, a wet, there was wet ceiling debris on the floor of our largest program space. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. incident. So many of the city's senior centers are in disrepair, especially those located in NYCHA developments. With the rapidly growing increase in our city's older population, the city will need to improve the current condition, conditions in these centers, invest in infrastructure, and support more cult culturally competent aging services to reflect the diverse identities and needs of our, of our city's older population. Your support continues to be greatly valued and appreciated. Thank you. Next. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to speak and also for organizing this hearing. My name is Lillian and I am the program director at Hamilton Madison House, Smith Senior Services, Newark, a naturally occurring retirement community. We are located in NYCHA's Alfred E. Smith Houses of Lower Manhattan. We serve the older adult residents of Smith Houses and we're all also open to seniors residing throughout the five boroughs of New York City. To provide some background, the Smith Houses was built by NYCHA in 1951 to 1953 and is home to over 4,000 residents. More than 30% are seniors over the age of 60. Many of these seniors visit Smith Newark for services and activities, not just because of the close proximity, but also because they rely on our services for their livelihood. With over 1,600 members, Smith Newark provides social services in Chinese, Spanish, English, healthcare management services in partnership with visiting nurse services, daily hot nutritious lunch, health promotion and recreational activities to help seniors age in place. As a NORC program, we would not exist without NYCHA, so I have to express my gratitude for that. However, I'm here to shed light on some of the facility issues that impact the quality of our work, and these are very real issues that put the safety and health of our seniors and staff at risk. I have selected four of the most pressing issues that we have been dealing with in the past year. Number one, sewage backflow in our lunchroom. There is a sewer connected to the development's main line. During heavy rain, when the main line is clogged, our lunchroom becomes flooded by the backflow. This happens at least twice a year. And when this happens, there is no clear channel of communication to expedite service from NYCHA. Instead, we are left with the time-consuming process of calling the central number, placing a ticket, making panic calls to our management office. And finally, we are left with no choice but to pull up our sleeves and address the matter ourselves. And even in the aftermath of these events, we are told by NYCHA maintenance workers that it is difficult for them to fix the issue. They will simply have to order a new cap for the sewer to put a lid on the problem. So far, we're still waiting, and the most recent incident was in September. Number two, excess heat. It has been a daily occurrence that the heat in some of our office is so strong that the temperature measures 90 degrees. Sure, it's better than having no heat, but we often hear reports from our seniors that they too experience the same problem in their apartments. And NYCHA fails to adjust the heat to the proper temperature. As many of our seniors are frail, it is difficult for them to physically open the window to, for cooler air, and we fear that overheating may be a real danger to them. Number three, pest control. We have seen mice and water bugs become a regular occurrence at our center. NYCHA's extermination services are not sufficient, and we believe this problem is a development-wide issue. Our only resort has been to hire a private exterminator who has been more diligent in inspecting and treating each area of our facility. However, we need NYCHA to also treat this issue with more attention and resources. Number four, leaks. Leaks are a regular occurrence because our facility and its pipes are old. Often it takes NYCHA several hours to respond and sometimes the responding personnel does not have the expertise to address the problem. They call in a referral to another maintenance worker and this is a time consuming process. 
which takes away our time, which should be better allocated towards serving clients. So with the issues that I have highlighted, I appeal tonight to do the, to do the following. Number one, expedite service during emergencies. Number two, have more qualified personnel and maintenance workers readily available. Number three, create a more efficient system, create a more efficient service request system so that maintenance issues can be communicated more quickly and effectively. And lastly, allocate more resources to capital improvements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Good morning. My name is Paki Kane. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Stanley M. Isaacs Neighborhood Center. I'm here on behalf of Gregory J. Morris, who's the um, Executive Director of our organization. Uh, I want to thank Chair Ambry Samuel, Chair Margaret Chin, and other members of the committee for this important hearing and for bringing us all together to talk about these issues. Um, I'm not going to read my testimony, but I am going to try to highlight some of the pieces in here and some other things that I think would be helpful for the committee to consider. Um, I am disheartened to know that some of the things that we are experiencing, obviously there are others um, my colleagues are also experiencing across the city. With that said, I know the good people that are sitting to my right who represent the leadership of NYCHA and DIFTA have all the good intentions in mind. Um, they certainly don't see any of these issues as being unimportant and certainly want to address them. Um, the issue is that I don't believe they have the resources to do it. Um, with that said, Isaac's Homes, Homes Particular Homes Development is um, a, a site for an infill project that's happening. Um, and there is going to be, there are going to be some private dollars that come into our site as a result of that project and we are heartened to know that. Um, there are other infill projects that are happening across the city or will happen across the city through which we can also draw, draw some private dollars. I think there are certainly opportunities to, for us to have conversations with private developers about how they can make a stronger investment in NYCHA so that they can do the work that I know that they want to do. Um, in addition to that, um, the, it is clear to us from our perspective that there are certain pieces of services to seniors that are critical, right? Meals, case management, all of the things that we've been talking about for decades that, are, that remain underfunded. Um, there is great opportunity, I think, in the coming months to work with the new leadership at DIFTA um, on the RFPs that are coming up and to think about how we can create um, not just additional funding, which is what we always talk about, but cost efficiencies in the system. I think that there are providers who are willing and ready to sit together at the same table and figure out how we more cost effectively deliver services and eliminate duplication across the system. We want to be at the table with all of you to try to figure some of that out before the RFP comes out. And so obviously there's a comment period during the concept paper which we'll take advantage of, but if there are additional conversations needed, we hope you'll consider um, sitting with us and obviously have leadership from the city at, at the table as well. The last thing I want to sort of talk about is investment from the council. Um, obviously there are, uh, you know, there's different opportunity I think on the council side. Um, there's less money that, you, that, that this body necessarily um, allocates as opposed to the other side and we understand that. With that said, there, there, there is opportunity I believe for the council to sit down and look at whether there, there are discretionary dollars that can be set aside for facilities and maintenance costs for organizations like ours as, as at the very least as a stopgap measure for now. Um, so those are some of the suggestions that I have. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have for me. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for, you know, giving examples of what's going on every day uh, at the centers um, that are inside NYCHA, and hopefully um, during the, the administration's panel, they can help address some of those issues that was raised. This is for um, Stanley Isaacs. Is is there a way you can um, just shed some light on the work that you have been doing um, with NYCHA, with the seniors related to um, the repairs that were needed and um, uh, any ideas about um, what we can ask of the administration for more funding or, um, um, or maybe the work that you've done with NYCHA during like the work group meetings related to um, the repairs and how much the repairs actually cost. 
if at all, if, if you were involved at all in any of those conversations? So I personally was not. I was not at Stanley Isaacs um, at the time when I believe it was UNH who was having some of the conversations with OMB and NYCHA and others. I will say that um, General Ma Manager Masuchulo has been to the Isaac Center. Um, we've had some great conversations with him and his leadership team. He has a wonderful staff who I think really wants to do the right thing. Um, and, and we're appreciative of that. Um, I, uh, like I said, I don't believe that they necessarily have the, um, the resources to do what needs to get done across the city. Um, I think what would be helpful for us to understand is how repairs get prioritized or how repairs sort of happen across the city. I don't know that there's transparency in that. Um, I think, you know, when there are sort of 24-hour emergency tickets and those types of things put in, um, there are, I would imagine, thousands of them across the city. So how do you how do you prioritize? And when is it that we sort of know whether someone's going to come or, or, or not? And I, and I feel like that having at least that transparency would help some of these um, organizations prepare for what's coming next. Um, so information, even if it's not resources, information I think is helpful. And I think NYCHA has certainly tried um, to, to, to provide that when we've asked for it. Although I think, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do when there's, there's a very long to-do list. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question. Okay, thank you for your testimony. You. And we're going to call up uh, the panel from the administration, representative from uh, DIFTA and NYCHA. And we've been joined by our majority leader, Councilmember Laurie Cumbo. Oh, and Councilmember Deutsch. Can you uh, please identify yourself uh, before the uh, council and minister the oath? Hi, I'm, I'm David Priston. I'm executive vice president for external affairs at NYCHA. Good morning, I'm Karen Resnick. I'm acting commissioner at the New York City Department for the Aging. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone. I'm Yuka Buskett, senior director for NYCHA's family partnerships department. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Jasper. I'm Vice President of Operations with the New York City Housing Authority. Good morning. Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner, Bureau of Community Services at DIFTA. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to, con to council member questions? I do. I do. <laughs> Chair Zalika Amprey Samuel and Margaret Chin, members of the Committees of Public Housing and Aging, and other distinguished members of the City Council. Good morning. I am David Priston, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for External Affairs. Joining me today are Deborah Goddard, Executive Vice President for Capital Projects, Yuka Buzketh, Senior Director of Family Partnerships uh, Department. Carolyn Jasper, Vice President for Operations, as well as our partners from the City Department of, for the Aging, DIFTA. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the authority's work to provide the more than 80,000 seniors living in our developments across the city with safe, supportive communities and access to quality services. We provide testimony on this topic to the Council. We provided testimony on this topic to the Council on October 2017 and are happy to provide you with an update today on senior services and centers at NYCHA. While NYCHA faces significant challenges, a loss of $3 billion in federal operating and capital funding over the last 17 years, 
and a $32 billion capital need, we are firmly committed to our seniors and believe that all New Yorkers deserve to age in place with dignity in their homes. In recent years, we have consider reconsidered how we work, focusing on our core responsibility to be a better landlord. This has led to creative, new approaches to serving residents, particularly our seniors who are aging in place. As part of that focus, we've moved away from directly providing social services and to connecting residents to best-in-class services from the vast network of social service providers throughout the city. NYCHA helps our seniors thrive in a number of ways, with initiatives that positively impact seniors living in our developments, as well as programs that serve only our most vulnerable. If you're a senior at NYCHA, you can benefit from physical improvements to our buildings, access to on-site and nearby services, connections to services, and age-friendly reasonable accommodation policies. As a landlord, NYCHA continues to focus on improving our buildings to enhance residents' quality of life. As mentioned last year, we updated the architectural design guidelines for the rehabilitation of our buildings, taking into account age-friendly and accessible designs, as well as DIFTA's age-friendly New York City report and HPD's guidelines for senior housing. Whenever the funding is available to upgrade our buildings, these standards will better support the safety, health, and comfort of residents including their ability to age in, pace, age in place gracefully. Guided by the new architectural standards, in 2017 and 2018, we invested over $8 million in, to make accessible and age-friendly improvements at 66 developments, such as more comfortable seating areas on the grounds for seniors. The new LED, the new LED exterior lighting that we're installing across the city makes it easier for everyone, including our seniors, to see. We are eager to get the funding necessary to complete more of these projects in the future. The 110 senior centers at NYCHA, including the 96 senior centers and senior social clubs sponsored by DIFTA, provide a range of recreational, health, and cultural activities, services, and resources that enhance the lives of NYCHA residents and other seniors in the community. On any given day, seniors, can, seniors participate in free exercise classes, discussion groups, or blood pressure screenings. At DIFTA-funded senior centers, older New Yorkers can get free meals, counseling on social services, or assistance with benefits. Regardless of where they live, most NYCHA seniors have access to a program on-site or within their community. The 14 senior centers that are not run by DIFTA are still operated by NYCHA through funding from the mayor's office. The funding we have received $3 million a year allows us to fully or, uh, fully or partially operate senior center programming and meal services. Since 2015, attendance has increased by 42% at these centers. This demonstrates how important they are for our aging population. While we are committed to our senior centers, NYCHA's capital needs total $32 billion, including the significant repair needs at our senior centers. Discussions with our partners at OMB and DIFTA about how to best improve our centers are ongoing. We will continue to work with them to lay out clear roles and responsibilities for each party and determine the best strategy for financing existing repair needs within the context of NYCHA's larger capital need. These centers are valuable assets to our communities that deserve to be preserved. But given NYCHA's dire financial position and more than $30 billion in capital needs, it is difficult to accommodate both the repairs needed to secure our residents' homes as well as fix our centers. We are in discussions with our partners at OMB and DIFTA on a memorandum of understanding to improve how we repair our centers. This MOU, once finalized, will lay out clear roles and responsibilities for each party, making senior, senior center management more straightforward. Although this MOU is expected to be completed earlier this year, thoughtful discussions are ongoing. NYCHA's Community Engagement and Partnership Department fulfills NYCHA's goal of engaging residents and connecting them to best-in-class services. By engaging key populations, including seniors, and connecting them to critical and social services from community-based organizations and other city agencies, seniors are supported as they age in place at NYCHA. We know we cannot do this alone, which is why we streamlined how we partner with local providers through our zone model. Partnership is key to serving our seniors. NYCHA works with dedicated providers across the city to meet their needs. Here are some examples of services our partners provide. The HUD-funded Senior Resident Advisor Program provides on-site assistance to seniors in need of, at six sites. 
helping them live safely and independently in their homes through home visits, connections to services, and regular visits by volunteer floor captain neighbors. Another HUD-funded initiative, the Elder Safe at Home program, provides crime prevention and social service assistance and educational workshops to seniors at four sites in the South Bronx. Socially isolated or homebound seniors in all five boroughs receive regular home visits through Henry Street Settlement's Senior Companion Program. Senior companions are healthy, older adults who help their fellow seniors live independently by helping them go shopping and go to the doctor's appointments and do errands and by simply providing companionship. Currently, our partners, Presbyterian Senior Services, Hudson Guild, Union Settlement, and Project Find are serving residents at specific developments in their service areas. NYCHA is finalizing partnership with 16 additional providers that will also assist seniors directly and 11 partners will be located at NYCHA's Family Partnership Department offices to provide helpful services to seniors. At our 74 only senior buildings and 11 NORCs, retirement communities that are naturally occurring, seniors and their caregivers are supported with on-site and nearby assistance. This includes one-on-one -on -one counseling, as well as recreational and cultural opportunities from DIFTA and many other providers. At nine NORC sites, Homebound and non-homebound seniors are connected to senior services and get help with accessing public benefits and improving their health. NYCHA is applying for six more NYCHA buildings to be designated as NORCs, and we expect to hear back about their eligibility next year. And just this last Friday, we activated 82 new senior champions across our developments. These NYCHA leaders participated in workshops on creating health, safety, and educational activities for seniors in NYCHA communities. We appreciate Councilmember Diana Ayala's participation in this valuable initiative. NYCHA provides vital, provides vital support to seniors in many ways, from senior center programming to the dedicated services available at our senior-only buildings, from the new housing we're creating exclusively for seniors to our reasonable accommodation policies that facilitate assistance from caregivers. We are eager to continue engaging with the council and other partners across the city as we work to transform NYCHA and enhance the level of services offered to our seniors. Thank you for the opportunity to continue the dialogue on this important topic. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Good morning, Chairpersons Chin, Amphrey Samuel, and members of the Aging and Public Housing Committees. I'm Karen Resnick, Acting Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, and I am joined this morning by Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Community Services as DIFTA, as well as my partners from the New York City Housing Authority. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify on the topic of senior services and centers in NYCHA. DIFTA funds a number of senior programs located in NYCHA developments. These programs include senior centers and other affiliated sites. In addition, DIFTA sponsors nine natural occurring retirement communities, NORCs, programs at NYCHA locations. Also, under the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, the MAP program, DIFTA's Grandparent Resource Center works with residents at 15 NYCHA developments that are part of this initiative. DIFTA's Senior Center portfolio includes 71 NYCHA sites. In addition to the Senior Center network, DIFTA funds other affiliated sites in NYCHA developments, which include social clubs and satellites. Senior centers provide meals at no cost to participants through modest voluntary contributions. At senior centers, older New Yorkers can participate in a variety of recreational, health promotional, and cultural activities, as well as receive counseling on social services and obtain assistance with benefits. The social clubs comprise the 17 senior centers formerly operated by NYCHA, which transitioned to DIFTA sponsorship in FY16. The satellite programs encompass senior centers that were formerly funded through council discretionary allocations, as well as the initial four senior centers that transferred from NYCHA to DIFTA. The other affiliated sites provide educational and recreational programming, but are smaller in scope and may not include the range of services available at a DIFTA senior center. 
In FY18, more than 7,500 older New Yorkers participated daily in DIFTA-funded senior centers and affiliated sites at NYCHA locations. These programs also serve nearly 2.1 million congregate meals in fiscal year 18. Additionally, the Technology Education and Municipal Facilities Initiative by the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer seeks to increase older adult access to broadband services and NYCHA developments. Technology classes and events are held at Mott Haven Houses in the Bronx, Jefferson Houses in Manhattan, in Council Member Ayala's district, Red Hook, Red Hook Houses in Brooklyn in Council Member Menchaca's district, Queens Bridge Houses in Council Member Van Bramer's district, and Stapleton Houses in Staten Island in Council Member Rose's district. The city has defined naturally occurring retirement communities as residential locations, single buildings, housing developments, or clusters of buildings within a neighborhood that are neither age restricted nor built specifically for seniors. Over time, as residents have aged in place, these housing locations have become home to significant concentrations of older adults. There are five primary objectives for DIFTA-funded NORC programs. All NORC programs should provide supportive environments that allow seniors independence as they age in place, engage residents and facilitate linkages within the community, assess the needs of senior residents, and offer supportive services based on assessments and build strong and meaningful communities that cultivate new roles for community members. Nine NYCHA developments are served by DIFTA-funded NORC programs, including Smith Houses in Manhattan in Chair Chin's district, Coney Island 1, Site 8 in Brooklyn in Council Member Traeger's district, Ravenswood Houses in, in Queens in Council Member Van Bramer's district, and Pelham Parkway Houses in the Bronx in Council Member Janai's district. The NORC programs provide services such as case management for homebound and non-homebound seniors, assistance with accessing public benefits, and an increased emphasis on wellness, chronic disease risk ass assessments, and healthcare management. The Grandparent Resource Center, the first of its kind in the nation, was established by DIFTA in 1994. The GRC provides a number of supportive services to those older adults who are raising grandchildren and other young relatives. Resource specialists at the GRC offer advocacy and case assistance, as well as referrals to appropriate community-based organizations. These CBOs provide services such as preventive services, legal services, financial assistance, advocacy, educational services, tutoring services for children, family counseling, and support groups. In order to serve some of the neediest kinship caregiver families, the GRC program expanded under the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety. As part of the MAP initiative, GRC community advocates work with residents at 15 NYCHA developments and provide resources and services to grandparent caregivers. Through the initiative, grandparent and relative caregivers have received grandparenting education, community safety trainings, intergenerational program, and peer support on raising children. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony on senior services and centers in NYCHA, and my colleagues and I are pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony, and we've been joined by uh, Council Member Ayala and Council Member Vallon, both on the Committee on Aging. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions and then I'll pass it on to my co-chair and to other council members. Um, for DIFTA and NYCHA, my question is the, the social clubs. Um, the administration has been funding uh, the transition for the last, what, three years already? And there are still 14 social clubs that are still under NYCHA, um, so can you give us an update on what's the progress on that? Are they gonna be all transfer over um, to, to uh, DIFTA? Or is this three million is gonna continue again in this year's budget? Um, as we have testified in the, in the past, the 14 centers that remain operated by NYCHA really 
falls short of meeting DIFTA's criteria to be a full-fledged senior center. And they're even, in some cases, smaller than other satellite programs. So from DIFTA's perspective, because of the smaller numbers of participants, and in many cases, the actual size of the facility, um, they don't really rise to the size of a senior center program. So I believe the plan is that NYCHA will continue to operate and run those 14 sites in the coming year. So that, that is correct. Um, we, look, we, we recognize this valuable resource to the residents within these communities. And we, um, I think, as I stated in the testimony, there, six of these sites are actually in areas where we are going to, where we are um, in the process of um, responding to the New York State Office of Aging's um, NOFA for um, NORCs. And with that, um, the idea would be that we would be, um, we're seeking, currently seeking partners, um, providers who would be partners in that application. Um, and that, that would be a way to bring funding in to enhance the services that are provided at those, at those sites. Um, so those sites are Highbridge, Sedgwick, Glenmore Plaza, Sumner, Taft, and Wagner. Um, and for the, uh, regardless of whether we receive that de designation or not, um, we are prepared to continue to run those sites, and um, we have that expectation that, um, so we're prepared to continue to run them otherwise. So are you saying that if you don't get the funding from the administration, you're still going to continue um, the other social clubs? That, that is that is our that is our plan. Um, you know, we were appreciative of when the council um, funded these sites, and over the last two years, the mayor's office has has provided funding. And our expectation, our plan is to prepare for that um, if we don't get the funding from the uh, from the Newark NOFA. Are there any plans in terms of because the, the six that you have identified could qualify as a Newark within the own building, right? So what about the other ones? Are there a possibility working with DIFTA to sort of like create neighborhood norks where the services can be open, uh, maybe even to non-NYCHA residents, and to be able to create a, a program that can serve as seniors in that area? So I'd just like to offer that our existing services in those communities, case management, home-delivered meals, adjacent nearby senior centers, are all in place and available to NYCHA residents in those facilities. So that's not a NORC per se, but our case management services are available. So in many instances, we are providing services to large numbers of older adults living in those facilities. The only thing I'd add is, I mean, we, we, are, we are in regular contact and discussion with DIFTA and the city. Um, evaluating these centers and you know and the overall services for our seniors so I mean although we only have current plans because of these are the ones that are actually eligible to be um, to, to be a NORC um, you know we will continue to have conversations about how to continue to support these these seniors okay I mean the thing about in terms of intergeneration community center it just seems like after all these years you still haven't come up with some solution or some suggestion in terms of how to maintain service or even expand services um, in those development. So that's something I think that the DIFTA and NYCHA had to keep on continuing work, to work together on that. Now for the six that you think will qualify for NORC for state funding, what, if you get the funding, what's DIFTA's role? Is DIFTA gonna have oversight On those NORC program? No, I don't believe we would. Um, it would be NYCHA as the manager and whatever social service agency would be in partnership and they would have responsibility and no, we would not have oversight. So on that though, it's like, DIFTA also operate, I mean, have oversight of NORCs that are in NYCHA now, right? So. Who provide fundings for those NORC that DIFTA has oversight on? I know we have nine NYCHA um, 
nine DIFTA funded NORCs in NYCHA facilities and they are tax levy funded. So they're funded by the state or they're funded by the city? City. city. They're funded by the city. So if they're funded by the city, then DIFTA has oversight. Then we have oversight. oversight, correct. If they're funded by the state. Then the state office for the aging has oversight. But then and there's no connection, so DIFTA doesn't. I mean, in, in some of our NORC portfolio, there are providers that have both state and city funding, so then we work together. But if they were exclusively state funding, then we would not have an oversight role. I mean, we did used to convene a NORC, um, and I, I'm sure we still do, sort of an advisory get-together of all the NORC programs, and Karen is our resident NORC expert. So we are always offering technical assistance, and so we would welcome them into the portfolio. Absolutely. Okay, I mean, just on, the, on that, because in the council, we've been working on creating new NORCs. Mm -hmm. And the last budget, we just created one in uh, Council Member Abel Samuels' district. Sure. And we're going to look to continue to do more of that in absence of state funding or hopefully the administration will pick it up baseline, increase the funding, because NORC is so necessary. And that's what I'm looking at, all the, the one that's left over, the eight that is, you don't know what to do with them, that maybe working with the council, we can figure out a creative way of either doing a NORC there or some kind of intergenerational program. Um, we got to be able to, to find a, a solution and not just let them just hang out there. Um, Chair Abio Samuel has a follow-up question on this NORC. Is it just a point of clarification? Um, David, you said that there are 96 senior centers and social clubs that are sponsored by DIFTA, um, but then Ms. Resnick said that DIFTA's senior portfolio includes 71 NYCHA sites. So I just wanted to get some clarification around the numbers first. I, I don't think the 71 included the social clubs, the okay. 17 social clubs. So 71 plus 17. Yeah, that's correct. We broke them out by full, fully operated centers, social clubs, and satellites. But and the numbers are the same. Okay. And um, just one other quick, just clarification around senior centers versus the social club. And there was a comment about the size of it. And um, for, for me, Brownsville Houses has a social club. And that's a NYCHA operated social club. That's a NYCHA operated social club. Yes. And Kingsborough Extension is a senior center, correct? Yes. It's and the there are more people that attend the Brownsville Social Club than the actual Kingsborough Senior Center. Um, but that's a social club that's listed as part of the 11 or 14. So, so we can. And so, I was just trying to get at the actual number of participation because when you go into the Brownsville Social Club, it's crowded. But it you is. can go to a right. senior center, and there's about five people there. And then also comparing it to, I know Glenmore Plaza is on the list, and there was a mention. Um, um, I know that particular is. Glenmore Plaza is not a senior center, and there's a handful of people there. But when you go into Van Dyke, which is a senior center, Van Dyke Two. It's extremely small when you compare it to Glenmore. So, so, some, so I'm just trying to get an understanding because some social clubs have more participation than some senior centers, and then some social clubs are maybe larger than some of the centers. And so can you explain how you came with the rhyme or reason around which ones um, would not receive funding and what should? Because what you just stated around the numbers and the size is not really what okay. it uh, is. Let me just clarify something. The term social clubs was um, a term that DIFTA gave to the 17 centers that had been previously operated directly by NYCHA when they were transferred to DIFTA. Uh, this was uh, because they were smaller and the services were um, kind of a mix of different kinds of services and not the prescribed senior center services that had been required in our last senior center RFP, so we gave them the, def the definition of social clubs. But you just said some of smaller, 
And so, so I just wanted yes, to sm- clarify that because smaller. some are not right. that small. Some are actually but larger of, in size. I think some of the centers, though, that you're referencing are still NYCHA senior centers. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Brownsville and Glenmore are NYCHA senior centers. Uh, um, we call them senior centers, not social club. Right. I think that's a term that if the call, the 17 that were transferred to them. Mm-hmm. I do know that the average daily attendance at Brownsville is quite large, it's about 50 plus seniors, mm-hmm. and the one at Glenmore has less attendees, but we, we call them all senior centers, the 14 that we are operating. So NYCHA doesn't use the terminology social club? No. Okay. So when we did an RFP several years ago, we defined senior center as having 60 participants and 60 meals per day and 75 attendees participating in activities. So we continue to monitor and talk to NYCHA about what's happening in the programs they run and if attendance is increasing and if they were ever to sort of get that kind of attendance, then of course we would consider um, bringing them into our portfolio. We need some uh, data information. I think we would like you to send to us um, all the the center social club that's operated in NYCHA uh, in terms of the program that they offer and the number of daily participants so that we could get a better sense of how large they are and and what we can help with. Because I think that there's got to be some solution that we could work on. because even the, the six that you identify to the state, I don't know when the RFP is out or is there a process? How soon do you think you can get funding uh, for those centers that you think could qualify as a NORC from the, the state program? So the, the RFP uh, or the NOFA is out. It's due February 1st, and it will fund those, if selected, those centers for five and a half years. Um, starting in July. Starting in July of 2019. Yes. Okay. So we might not have to pick it up (laughs) in the council's discretionary funding. (laughs) That's good. Um, We also wanted to to see how the coordination, because in this uh, in this hearing we want to talk about the repair issue and you heard from our opening remarks, and we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Salamanca, and thank him for bringing some visual to show some of the center in his district. I mean, th- that looks very bad. Um, so how does NYCHA and DIFTA coordinate in terms of these kind of repair to expedite? And you've heard from um, some of the providers earlier, especially uh, from Hamilton Madison House talking about Um, the issues that they have and they weren't able to get uh, expedited repair. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to just to to talk about this. So I think it was actually mentioned in the last um, in the last panel by one of the providers. Um, Mm -hmm. We we do split up how we do the repairs. Um, So the provider, um, when a repair is within the interior of the four walls of the build of their of their facility, and it is um, more of a standard, simpler, less complex um, maintenance repair, then they are responsible for those repairs, and they work closely with DIFTA on securing a vendor um, to come and do that work um, themselves, um, to have a vendor come and do that work. Um, and that is usually a faster way to do the repair than um, having NYCHA come and do it. NYCHA is responsible for um, the larger infrastructure um, and syst- systems issues that um, that are related to the, the larger structure of the building. So there are shared systems. So we, we hear about some providers talking about sewage backup um, and uh, you know issues around heat. And to the degree those systems are shared with the larger development or the, or the building that it sits within, then in those cases NYCHA is responsible for those repairs. Um, sometimes where there um, are delays is sometimes when we initially identify something as a, simp- uh, as a simple repair um, and a vendor comes in to take a look at it, sometimes as the vendor goes in and looks at what the issue is, it's identified that it's actually a, a larger structural or a structural issue. 
Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Matthew Eugene. Um, that will lead to, I think, in terms of this year's uh, budget. And we had the hearing uh, last month with DIFTA about their capital needs for senior centers. When you look at those pictures, uh, a lot of those issues are capital needs. So NYCHA and, and DIFTA is like, do you have a capital budget need for repair, I mean, to really take care of the senior center social club that are housed in NYCHA? Sorry, so are you asking, does, does DIFTA or does NYCHA have a capital repair to deal with? Both of you. <laughs> so for, for, I'll speak for NYCHA. So uh, as we, I think we've discussed um, with, 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 with all of you um, and, and uh, you know, kind of at length with, uh, with Chair Amprey Samuel and, and her committee, we have um, a $32 billion capital need across the port. I, I know that, I know that. But I think my point is that we want to be helpful. I think a lot of the council member wants to be helpful. And we want to know, do you take, really pay attention to what the needs are in the senior center? Because the condition in the senior center at NYCHA are, are not good compared to other senior centers. So if there are special attention pages, like what, what are the capital needs? And then maybe we can all help to find resources to take care of that. I remember last month in, in our, the hearing with NYCHA on capital need, you don't even really have a capital budget that provider can come and say, I need to fix the bathroom, I need to fix the, the ceiling. Um, come on, I mean, you should have some kind uh, a budget request to the administration and we can help and we can work with you to make sure that our senior have a nice place to go to for their center. That is unacceptable. Uh, so we want to be helpful. So let us help. Thank you, and we really do appreciate that. And I want you to understand, of course, that it is an extreme priority for us to make sure that all of these repairs and maintenance work are done. We talked at length at our last hearing about capital budget, so there's some definition issues. We use expense dollars in order to make the minor repairs within the walls of the senior center, and we, as they come to us, we prioritize them and we make funds available um, to do that. And where it gets complicated, of course, is when you know it's an apartment above or a, a roof leaking problem, and then it you know becomes part of NYCHA's overall capital budget need. So our intent is there, and I think the prioritizing and the funding availability to do some of the major capital repairs is part of what makes it complicated. Um, also, I think, uh, let, me, let me pass it over to our Executive Vice President, Deborah Goddard, who can speak more to, she's, she's the Executive Vice President for, cap, for our capital program, so she can talk a little more about the capital needs. Uh, she has to be sworn in first, thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. So I just want to pick up where things were left off and, and, and revisit some of the stuff we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, we can't divorce this from the $32 billion need. As a number of folks have mentioned, and particularly um, the issues, for instance, at Smith Houses, I'm not sure if we're seeing a a general pipe leak here. I'm not, I'm not sure what we're looking at, but if we're talking capital, um, so at Smith Houses, the issue of overheating or the issue of the sewage, that's not something that can be separated from the overall capital need at Smith Houses. And so, um, you know, the mayor has put money into our roofs, he's putting money into our heating plants. Smith, unfortunately, is scheduled for state money for its heating plant, held up in Albany, as you know, but these are not items that can be isolated simply to a given community center and they do play in to the overall need when we're talking capital of the 32 billion dollar need and I'm, I'm not quite sure what I, I think on the left we're looking at probably a roof a leak a pipe leak that maybe could be isolated and repaired but if it's an overall system for the building it's in or coming down um, from other apartments, then again, it goes to the fact that we've got issues with our distribution system in the whole building, 
and that would be a building capital need. I just ha I, I have a follow up. When you look at the P and A um, and review the thirty two billion dollar needs, um, just as an example, when I looked up Van Dyke two, there was a fourteen million dollar need. Um, Brown had a twenty million dollar need. Reed had thirty four million. Um, Kingsburg Extension had twenty million. Um, but then there was also a line item um, that that uh, mentioned the community centers mm -hmm. throughout some of them. Yes. Um, so if there is a line item that, that speaks to the, the centers right. um, under the P&A, um, but not all of the developments had that. So can you explain how some community centers had a capital repair need, but others didn't? Because when I looked at the P&A just preparing for this hearing, um, my eyes like focused directly on looking to see if some of those centers would be listed, and I was shocked that they were not, knowing that there are um, like so many complaints that are coming from the providers. So can you explain how maybe the centers were not, well, not some were and some were not? So all senators, all centers, all centers were included in the physical needs assessment. Some are, their needs are embedded in the building that houses them or the development that houses them, and some, Physically, that space stands alone, and you can say it needs a roof or it needs um, new windows. Um, so they are all included somewhere in that PNA, but often it's embedded in that. In that. So, is there um, um, like a spreadsheet that you can provide us with uh, the capital repair needs for each of the centers? We, um, in terms of the stuff that I'm speaking about, in terms of the needs, the larger capital needs, roofs or boiler systems, that is embedded in the development's p and and I wouldn't be able to figure out the square footage that might relate. Well, also, some of it's not practical, right? If Smith Houses has six boilers, it, you can't ration one boiler to the community center, so it really is embedded in that need for the overall development. Okay, I, I would like to have a follow up on that because I'm thinking about certain centers, like when I look at Reed, right? There were some, some structural issues at Reed and that's a standalone building. And when I looked at that, that was one of the ones that had a community center listed and that community center is clearly the senior center and the need was $3,500. Um, and then when I looked at Kingsborough Extension, um, that's a standalone building and there was no, um, um, capital repair need listed under the community center or, or community, a center period, but that's also a standalone. And so I was just trying to figure, so would that mean that there was no capital need for that particular It would probably mean in the, in the component replacement that it doesn't have a capital need. I mean, actually even, I'd have to go back and look at $3,000 doesn't rise to a capital need. That would be indic indicative of a repair need. So I'd have mm -hmm. to go take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Traeger and Council Member uh, Joya, and we're going to pass the, the question over to Council Member, and then the, us co-chair, we can ask more questions uh, later. Uh, but also, before you leave, um, in terms of, can you give us information? I mean, you can uh, send it later, but we want to know how you prioritize in terms of the, the capital needs um. So I'll go back to um, the conversation um, on the hearing on capital, capital needs. We look first to the exterior of the building, right? The roofs, the brickwork, because if you're not going to take care of that stuff, you could still have water infiltrating and damaging anything you do inside the building. Then we'll look at systems, heating, elevators, life safety, again, sort of the, the uh, skeleton of, of a building. And then we will look inside um, to things like tile, painting, kitchens, and baths. Well, well, we'll follow up with some more of those questions. Uh, Council Member Rose, since you're here really early, you're, you, you have questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Um, I, it, it saddens me uh, when, I, when I hear the, the running list of, of repairs uh, that our seniors are faced to um, endure. And you know, the disrepair of our NYCHA senior centers is endemic of the same blatant and criminal neglect that we've seen with the overall upkeep of, of NYCHA housing. Um, I had a, cent a center where 
the chronic seepage of raw sewage into the dedicated space at the Mariners Harbor Senior Center led to the closing of that center, rightfully so, and the dislocation of, of the seniors um, to another senior center that had a totally different um, culture and climate, was very far from their neighborhood, and um, was already very crowded, and, um, and led to their disconnection um, from the community. Um, the fact that NYCHA has a $32 billion um, deficit in terms of capital needs, I, I really would like you to tell me like where the senior center um, repairs sort of falls um, in, in your programming, your ideas to correct some of these things. And then um, I have, I'd like to know what the relationship is with DIFTA and NYCHA in terms of coordination. Um, I had allocated funding to New Lane Shores two years ago for a, a new air conditioning system. It has still not been installed. And um, my seniors are suffering, you know, greatly because of that. In addition to that, they have security doors that are inoperable. And um, we can't seem to figure out who should, you know, be doing that work and making those, um, those repairs happen. And then I'll ask another question. So first of all, um, we, we have, unfortunately we have, uh, the, you know, the situation you raised with um, sewage backup is not the only place where we've had this and it is regrettable and it, the inconvenience we, you know, we, we recognize and we are um, tremendously sympathetic to. Um, I think that being said, you know, this, this is, goes to, as, as Deborah, as our EVP for, uh, uh, capital mentioned this goes to the larger um, physical needs these are these are not um, just for the senior centers these are often shared systems across um, for an entire development um, in these situations as far as how we prioritize them the we prior these are top priority these are these are you know these are top priority repairs um, so I think we can go uh, I'll pass it over to um, our, our, um, our Vice President for Operations, who can speak a little bit more about um, maybe some of the specifics of how we address these things. Um, but, um, but I mean, we, we from, a, from, a, you know, from a repair perspective, these are top priorities and we address them as quickly as we can. Um, then it gets to a little bit of the, how do we address the root cause so we make sure that doesn't happen in the future. And, and don't forget, uh, I really need to understand how you address the fact that I allocated funding for, um, for repairs for a new um, air conditioning system and it still has not happened. Yes, yeah, so what, what we will, well, there's a couple questions you asked, so let me, let's first, um, if it's okay, we, we can get okay. to the, how we prioritize sure. um, you know, these sorts of issues. Okay. Council Member Rose, can you also ask your other question? Oh. Because we have a lot of council members oh, with questions, okay. so we're trying to. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, in that same vein, um, the upgrades uh, to interior spaces, like at Cassidy Coles and West Brighton um, Center, where um, they suffer from a lack of space, and it could be just a, a matter of re reallocating space, um, you know, would you be able to do that and, um, and you know, the remediation of mold and, and the leaks? Thank you. Thank you. So I will respond to your inquiry regarding how we prioritize work orders. Um, absolutely, you're correct regarding stoppages. The housing authority or the staff, we're responsible for addressing emergency or health-related or safety issues first. So those work orders are prioritized. So when it comes to a stoppage, most definitely, a stoppage should be identified and addressed within 24 hours, which means when our staff responds, if they are unable to address that stoppage, then they are required to procure a vendor in order to come out address the stoppage 
clean and sanitize the area. Um, as you know, many of our work orders that uh, we receive for our community centers are also in the pool of work orders that we need to address for the residents who are living within our units. So unless it is a health and safety related issue, you know, we try to, you know, again, we have to address them as, you know, um, the, the need arises. Um, for the most part, we do address our work orders for our community centers, non-emergency related work orders, um, within an average of 38 days. As you know, some of the work that's needed in the center also is related to repairs that are needed, perhaps maybe through our skilled trade staff. And our skilled trade staff, they're also scheduled to, again, prepare work within, those, within our um, apartment units. Some of the conditions that you uh, expressed here today, they're not acceptable, but we will work on addressing, you know, again, any health-related issues. And I would like to also mention that some of the issues that are presented here within the center and within this apartment, we will go back and we will follow up with staff to make sure we can work on addressing, you know, any issues that property management staff is required to address within that center or within the apartment. Ms. Jasper, yes. I'm really concerned about the fact that I gave them money for the air conditioning. And for me, that's a health-related issue. And it's taken two years, and it is still not done. And, and I feel that the safety of the in, inoperable doors is also a safety issue. And it, it just, you know, baffles me why it's taking so long for these two things that are funded already to happen. Okay. So, so I, I, I've, I've been told that, um, that the funding um, for the air conditioning we received in July of 18, um, and that work will be completed in, um, in, in by June of 19. So this coming summer, this coming summer, we will have the air conditioners in place. We started this two years ago. Now, I don't know why you just got that money in 18, but that money was allocated, and this project's been going on two years. Okay, well, so, but, so, but I've been told as far as that we will have the air conditioning in place by June of 19. June, June, of, June of 19. I'm really going to hold you to it because that will make three summers that they've been without air conditioning. Thank you, Council Member Rose. We will all help you make sure that that center gets the air conditioned before the next summer. Um, well, we, we just, I, I, we, I hear your frustration and I hear that you will be on top of it and we will be on top of it as well. I, I just wanna say that we hear that. And the door, please. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's another uh, follow-up that I'll uh, public housing chair, committee chair will work with us on because NYCHA gets a lot of allocation from the council for capital project and it takes very, very long. Just point of clarification, you mentioned 38 days. Is it 38 days to address the fix or, or 38 days to complete the actual repair? I apologize. Let me correct my statement. Okay. The average days of the, the work order is open, 38 days. So to from the inception of the work order being completed through the date that it's closed out, it's an average overall. So some trades may take a little longer, but it's an average of, say, for instance, our any paint work orders, vendor work orders, roofing work orders. It's an average of those different crafts to complete the work and close out the work order. And um, just a quick follow-up, too. Um, you mentioned that those work orders are included in the overall um, like work orders like for the whole system. If a, a center director contacts NYCHA about an issue, who do they contact at NYCHA? Do they just use the same um, CCC? I mean, they use the same exact process, or is there like some liaison between the senior um, directors. They call, 
I believe it's different venues. The senior director can call CCC in order to place a work order for the needed repair. In addition, we do have a liaison within the housing uh, Carl Walton that they do sometimes reach out to regarding repair related issues and those issues are related to property management staff. So there is a bit of a system where the senior centers and the directors do have a direct contact with someone at NYCHA, well, Carl Walton. And, and I'm sorry, they should also have a rapport with the property manager and the property maintenance supervisor at the development as well. So then are those um, work orders handled differently than the overall system? Like, can you explain that process? Sure, the work orders should be scheduled because as you know, uh, we have a limited number of skilled trade staff, right? And so what happens is that, you know, based on, I guess, when the work order comes in and the type of work that comes in, we have our staff that may already be scheduled out for scheduled appointments for specific types of work. If we determine that there is a need that needs to be addressed based on the severity, we can at times deploy specific staff to locations to inspect and address conditions based on the severity of the condition or the repair. Can I, can I add something? So um, all center staff or all community-based organizations know that they have to call the CCC center to register a repair need. They, they are told to do that first. They can send the ticket. Um, the providers can send it to DIFTA. Uh, the tick with the ticket number, DIFTA knows that they can send it to Carl Walton or myself, um, and we will filter it down to property management. We do encourage that e pro each provider have a relationship with their property manager to en encourage them to visit the centers and address uh, and build that relationship, but there is a process to escalate it up to um, DIFTA and then tonight just so we can all work to handle and resolve the issue. So is it, so the communication is encouraged, but there is no um, like formal policy that says that the senior directors meet with the property manager to discuss the issues inside of the centers on a monthly basis. And there's um, like a tracking system or some kind of spreadsheet that lists all of the issues within each senior center that the property managers can address because clearly there's trends across the city. So is there anything put in place so as a formal policy? So, I mean, as Yuka said, th there is no formal, there's no formal set like they need to be meeting once a month. Uh, it varies from, from development to development, um, you know, and it's, and I think it's to the, it's supposed to be to the needs of the provider and the, and the property manager. We encourage it on, on at NYCHA side, we encourage the property management to do that with their, any of their community facilities, um, the direct, you know, the senior directors on the, on site, um, but it's not a formal process. There's no, there's no, you need to meet once a month. We will follow up on that question, uh, but I wanted to give our colleague uh, opportunity to ask question. Uh, Council Member Vallone, followed by Council Member Salamanca. Thank you to both of our chairs. Uh, Chair Chin just had a hearing last month on DIFTA's ability to handle capital repairs, and this hearing is, is a direct result, because a lot of the questions that we received were, well, we have to speak to NYCHA, you have to speak to NYCHA. David, I'm looking at your testimony, as I always do, I look at the testimony, it's the lawyer side of me, page three, and there's nothing on that page that gives me any optimism that either NYCHA or DIFTA can handle the capital emergency that we're in. Your exact quotes are on this page that discussions with our partners at OMB and DIFTA about how best to improve our centers are ongoing. But given NYCHA's dire financial position and more than 30 billion in capital needs, it's difficult to accommodate both the repairs needed to secure our residents' homes as well as the fixes for our centers. The MOU is ongoing and will be completed earlier this year, but thoughtful discussions are ongoing. I, that's not acceptable. It is not acceptable, it's not acceptable for us as elected officials to go back and say, hey, don't worry, thoughtful conversations are ongoing, or there's not enough money in the budget from the administration to get this done. There are two major problems with this entire process, funding and the ability to get the capital work done. 
So we always want to assist on getting, we always, Margaret and everyone on aging always fights for the administration to give funding for DIFTA across the board because DIFTA gets lost in this myriad of problems and concerns and operating expenses and capital expenses. And here's another situation where 14 senior centers, not run by DIFTA, but operated by NYCHA, God bless you, are running on an annual budget of three million, but you're saying attendance has increased by 42%. So if attendance is increasing by 42%, how is the annual budget three million staying? So two things, One, I, I think we need to propose a separate entity or a separate capital improvement area that can handle, just like we did with the schools, that can actually handle the capital repairs to senior centers and NYCHA because NYCHA has so much on your plate right now. I don't know how, and it clearly, you're in your own testimony, you're even saying, I don't know how we can handle the emergency repairs at the NYCHA versus the NYCHA senior centers. It seems like you need help. So maybe we look at outside the box and say, based on the emergency the city's in, we need to prioritize these capital repairs at NYCHA facilities as well as NYCHA senior centers and DIFTA's run. For, my, my, has there ever been any thought to having capital repairs handled in a different process? I'm gonna have Deborah Goddard come up on our EVP for capital to Thank you. answer this question. So to speak first to the larger question of capital needs in general, um, and this question was raised two weeks ago at the capital needs um, hearing. Uh, at the start of next gen, there was uh, a look at moving capital construction projects out of NYCHA or into a different unit or so on and so forth. Um, and really taking a look at it, um, changing the name or place of the work and the, the the process wouldn't change the rules under which we operate, um, and it wasn't felt that, that was, there was anything of efficacy in that option. In terms of community center work in particular, we are actually working with DDC to move a number of our community center, including senior center projects, the larger ones, over to DDC to pursue so that we can um, move them and focus on our residential units. So which projects are being moved over to DDC and how do we determine which projects move to DDC and stay with NYCHA versus staying with DIPT? Um, I'd have to get you the list. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it, we're generally looking at some of the larger projects to move over to DDC, um, which they're obviously very well equipped to handle, but we can get you the list of what's gone over to DDC. Well, I would propose to the two chairs then that that's, that's a place where we can continue this conversation as to these, the list that's being formulated without our input as to where, which, what triggers a DDC repair, what triggers DIFTA handling on their own. And as we heard more last month that DIFTA has six staff apparently to handle capital. So I don't know how six staff can handle all the capital needs of the entire senior population in the city. But um, that's what these hearings are about. So I'm sorry, did I say? No, 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 no. I said DDC, right? Okay. You said DDC. Yeah. Okay. So the ones that are not being sent to DDC, then are they going to be handled internally through NYCHA? Yes, they're handled by NYCHA. Um, some of the work we do, some of the design work we outsource um, to keep things moving. Um, I also mentioned that we've been outsourced to, to AE I firms. To, you know, we don't do it all in-house is all I'm saying. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we, our infrastructure is stressed. The number of projects going up has increased dramatically, and so we are procuring program managers to increase our infrastructure um, to be able to deliver the projects more quickly. I, I think that's the path we need yeah. to go on. I think we all realize the state of emergency we're in, and I think that's, mm -hmm. we just, we don't want to blame, we want to proceed accordingly, and whatever we need to do, we want to do this. Thank you, Chairs, for the time. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Salamanca, your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair Chin, good morning, everyone. Um, I, um, I, uh, I represent the South Bronx. Um, just to give you a little bit about my district, um, I have the third largest NYCHA portfolio in the city of New York. I have 15,520 residents that live in my, uh, my NYCHA developments, 6,668 units in total. And there's a $1.2 billion need, a NYCHA capital need, in my, uh, in my council district. Um, the visuals that I have here uh, are from 372 East 152nd Street. 
the Melrose My Haven Senior Center. Um, this senior center is um, the senior center is is, is underneath a, a, a NYCHA senior building, which is an annex of the Melrose houses. Um, the uh, the photo to the to the right is an apartment to one of the seniors here. Um, the week of September 21st, um, I visited uh, the senior center and the senior named Sarah asked me to come up to her apartment so that we can take a look at these big holes that she had in her apartment. And we went up there and this is what NYCHA did. This is what NYCHA did to remedy the issue. They took brown paper bags to cover up those big holes in her apartment. And this was like this for over a year. In the senior center, there was a leak, uh, which was affecting the bingo room downstairs. And that leak was coming from this apartment right here uh, on, this, on this visual that you see to the right. Um, we visited her on September 21st. We informed NYCHA. We went there with, you know, with the press, and I returned on October 18th from that bathroom, and that leak was addressed. But it's unfortunate that that senior had to live like that for one year. Um, the photo to the right, to the left, to, to your left, is the Mount Haven Senior Center. And just to give you some um, insight, that senior center services on a daily basis 150 to 200 seniors in my, in my community. And the bag that you see there is in the dining room area where they eat, where they have breakfast, where they have lunch, and where they have programming. Imagine having to sit underneath a bag full of water while you're eating, avoiding from getting wet when it rains. And so that's not a pipe, that's the roof. That senior center, the way it's built, the roof on the side, there's, there's, there's no units on top of it. And that roof, when it rains outside, it rains inside. You are aware of this problem. You all are aware of this problem and it's a shame that my seniors have to live like this on a daily basis when it rains. Commissioner, um, I have a question for you. When was the last time you met with the mayor, Mayor de Blasio? I'm just curious. Have you ever met with Mayor de Blasio? I am on now in this acting role for my third day. So, um, no, I have not met with the mayor in my new capacity. Interesting. I hope you get to meet with the mayor de Blasio before his tenure is over. Um, and I really hope that, you know, in your capacity as the, uh, the you will be the commissioner of, uh, of DIFTA, that you can have an, a, a true conversation with the mayor and let him know how NYCHA is failing as seniors and how you have to work with NYCHA and you're providing a senior center in a NYCHA facility, and my seniors are suffering in these senior centers. I have no questions. I just wanted to make the statement because I'm disgusted by the services that NYCHA has given my community and my seniors in my district. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think I will do a follow-up question for you. Is that, does DIFTA monitor all the complaints or the tickets that the center uh, call in? And so how do you make sure that those repairs get done and how do you coordinate with NYCHA to make sure that the repair happens? So our center directors know to put in a ticket request to NYCHA. Usually, I can't say always, we are informed, um, our program officers, and we know about what kind of repairs and maintenance. They come to us to help do advocacy. We have a very good working relationship. Karen Taylor and her team will reach out to Yuka or Carl um, to work on making sure that repairs get done in a timely way. Since the time of our last hearing, um, this issue was raised. We have been in talks with NYCHA and we have agreed to formalize a system whereby we would get monthly reports about all of the ticket requests that are in from any of our centers. Um, we think that will be extremely helpful, as well as capital projects, so we can help keep track of those two. So we're going to put some kind of tracking system in place immediately. 
Is that part of that MOU that you were talking about? Uh, this is independent of that MOU. Okay. So what's the progress on that MOU is supposed to be done in the beginning of the year, and this is the end of the year already? I, I think um, we testified that, that those conversations are still ongoing. But don't you have a, a deadline? I mean, it was supposed to be uh, the beginning of the year. Um, we, we, we don't, there's no formal deadline. We had been, we were hoping for an MOU by now. Um, the, unfortunately, it is not complete and we're still working towards finalizing it. Who's the one that's tying it up? It's, there's, there's no, there's no one tying it up. It's three, I mean, there, there are three different agencies um, co in conversations, OMB, NYCHA, and DIFTA. And so OMB is the one that's tying it up, right? There, <laughs> there, all we right. are, we are all, we are, we are finalizing the details. We will talk to OMB. Uh, Council Member Ayala, uh, followed by Council Member Joya. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm really excited about this hearing because this is kind of what I live and, and breathe for. Um, I have too much experience with both the DIFTA Senior Center part of it and the NYCHA uh, part of it. I think I wanted to make a couple of comments because uh, I, I have to take the opportunity while you're here. Um, but I have several concerns. So one of them is the Wagner Houses Senior Center, which is uh, a smaller senior center that was not transferred over to the Department for the Aging because it didn't meet the requirement of the 60 uh, plus participants per day. Since then, we have, through initiatives that were created by our, our, our chair, uh, Margaret Chen, been able to supplement some of the uh, funding for that senior center by $30,000 a year, which has allowed them um, a lot of a lot of an opportunity to um, provide more uh, recreation activities and has increased their uh, daily uh, attendance numbers. However, their space is so small that they would never, ever, ever, ever be able to meet the 60 plus uh, person requirement because it's just not conducive to that type of programming. And I wonder, and I know on the Shola, Olatoye, we had a conversation about possibly finding them an alternative space within Wagner houses that we can move them to that would allow them the capacity to grow and then um, be transferred over to DIFTA. So I wonder if that's a conversation that ever transferred over uh, once the uh, the chair transitioned out of NYCHA um, and if there's any uh, intent to move the senior center and allow them the ability to grow. I, I do remember that conversation. I remember that meeting. Um, Councilmember Ayala, and I think you were looking at the daycare center yeah. to move the senior program to, but that's being um, renovated for management offices at Wagner. So at this point, there there are no spaces that we can move um, the, the senior center to unless we um, we can continue discussing it. I, I would appreciate it because I think it's a disservice to the senior center if they're making every attempt to grow you know, their attendance, um, and they're doing that successfully, but because of capacity um, issues, they're just not um, able to do that. Uh, well, no I, I can add that yeah. it is a shared building with the community center, and the center director do have the ability to use the other rooms during the, in the morning hours. She can expand and have an exercise program in the multi-purpose room or do a computer class in the, com it could be shared and they can utilize more of the space, so, um, I could schedule a meeting with SCAN, who's operating that site. That would require a lot of coordination. I was there last night, and the center downstairs is used by children most of the time. Right. And so there's a lot of, you know, um, extra uh, furniture and just things. It's not really the nicest environment um, for uh, programming for the, for, for the elderly. Um, in regards to Millbrook Senior Center, I have concerns because now that we have, we have an infill project at Millbrook Houses for 100% affordable housing that is coming with a new brand new senior center. I've been fighting for a contract for that senior center because it was promised to the residents of that development when it was proposed that we develop this senior building, um, that they would get a, br 
brand new senior center right now, they were, what they have is what we, was considered a satellite program um, that is actually part of the Betances contract. But it, the only reason that it's continued to stay open is because Betances was displaced because of the capital repair work that they needed to be done. But that's already finalized and that center is due to open relatively soon. And my concern is that once Betances opens, that the Millbrook uh, satellite will will shut down and leave that part of the community without um, those those services um, I would implore that there be conversation about continuing to keep it open until we find a resolution because it's a desperately needed resource for that community um, so that's more of a, of a comment uh, at Johnson Community Center where I have seniors and not technically a senior center but I have seniors that go there for an unofficial senior center um, we've had is a brand new community center seven maybe eight years old the the roof is leaking already there I, I believe is still under warranty but there hasn't been any um, discussion my predecessor Melissa Murphy Burrito put in um, resources to repair the roof the roof work has not been done nor have we or the provider been notified of when the work will be done and if that money is gonna come from the warranty is gonna if the warranty is gonna cover the cost of the, the repair work or if the money's coming from what uh, Melissa Murphy Burrito allocated so I would appreciate it if I could get if I could get some information on that as well in terms of a timeline and then last but not least I would say that you know Corsi houses I think that my NYCHA really missed a mark when you when when there was when the idea of creating senior housing in NYCHA it was a great idea right it was it, I think it was well intentioned but you cannot create senior housing without the additional uh, services being offered in the building. So if you have a section 202 building, you have 24 hour security, which is not provided at NYCHA. You have maybe half split day uh, security, which is a huge issue in my, for my constituents specifically, we've had prostitution, we've had drug arrests, we've had people sleeping in the hallways. These are vulnerable adults that are now alone in a building without proper security, without a social worker, without anybody really paying attention to what's happening. The, the repairs in those buildings need to be a little bit more expeditious. If you have an older adult who has not enough fat layered in their body, when it's hot, they get really hot. When it's cold, they get really, really cold. These are, these are you know, things that we don't really consider as we're looking at a tenant, but these are all those that come with specific you know, uh, needs that need to be considered. Um, um, so I think, you know, uh, I would love to see there be a system created that would ensure that when an elevator breaks in a building where you have older adults, that there's somebody there ASAP, that when there's a leak in the lobby, or I've had seniors that have had leaks, I've had water coming up from the sink, and they're like trying the best that they can, you know, to clean it up. That's a fall hazard, a fall hazard for an older adult coming in a life or death situation. It's not the same thing as if I fall and break, you know, a leg. I'm sure, I, you know, I, I have a, a faster, you know, ability to recuperate. It's not the same, when, you know, when you're an older adult. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do better. I didn't, I didn't, I don't think that the idea of removing social workers from these buildings was a great idea. I understand that NYCHA is not in the business of providing social services, but there could have been a more concerted effort to bring in a provider that could have provided that service because the expectation that the senior centers in some of those buildings is providing that service is not factual. I worked in those senior centers. It is not happening. We do not have the resources to really adequately reach out to all of those tenants and invite them to come and join the senior center. So that is not happening and there's no coordination between DIFTA, NYCHA, all those residents to ensure that it is. Those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. I hope uh, DIFTA and, and NYCHA took notes of all your comments. Um, we have questions by uh, Council Member Joyer followed by Council Member Traeger. Thank you, Chair. We should be judged as a city by how we treat our seniors, especially the most vulnerable seniors, those that live in our NYCHA facilities. During the summer at Pelham Housing, the Sue Ginsburg Senior Center, it took nearly a year to determine who was going to be responsible for the repair of an air conditioning unit. Not a replacement, a repair of a pump. NYCHA, DIFTA, JASA, 
most of the summer, those seniors went without an air conditioner. So participation was low, almost non-existent. A disservice to the center, the seniors, the complex. Throgs Neck housing, senior housing. We have some German made boilers that require a special mechanic to come out and make the basic of repairs, which takes days because of this particular boiler and the maintenance boiler mechanics that we currently have contracted are not up to par to work on this particular boiler. Meanwhile, my seniors go without heat, hot water, sporadic heat, sporadic hot water. It is beyond forgiving, beyond explanations. There is no more excuses. The seniors have had it. It falls on the elected officials to make the basic of calls to get something done. My question is, what's the difference between a repair and a capital improvement? Is it a dollar amount? I'm gonna bring Deborah Goddard up to answer that question. Good afternoon. A dollar amount is one indice, but in general it is, uh, a capital improvement is something that is simply not bringing some, something back to working order. It is something that is relates to a system and improves, uh, increases the value of the asset. So the dollar value can be an indice, but it's not the to totality of the question. So a pump for an air conditioning unit, I would imagine, would be a basic repair. Correct. For it to take several months, from May through August, I believe, to replace a pump, is that acceptable to anyone on this panel? No. Are any of you familiar with this issue at Sue Ginsburg Center at the Pelham Housing? Do you want to elaborate? We, I mean, it's not acceptable for seniors to be without AC wet in the in the heat of the summer. Um, Hold on one second. So there was a contractor hired to convert the system from heating to cooling, mm. and they discovered the pump was broken, and there was, um, we, we, the provider reached out to DIFTA, and I think eventually they decided to fund it. It was funded by DIFTA, the repair, but it did take a while. It took the whole summer. Oh, okay. Sorry. For a basic pump. First, it took several months or to determine who was going to be responsible. Was it going to be NYCHA, DIFTA, JASLA? It became a whole complex debate over responsibility. Yes. That, it actually began with getting a contractor there to switch it from heat to AC, which Correct. took quite a bit of time. Yes. Then the pump was removed. No one can relocate the pump, I would imagine, because nobody wants to accept responsibility for replacement or repair. So they had to get a quote, and I think it was about $10,000, and DIFTA agreed to fund it, but it did take a while to repair. They had to order it. Commissioner, you indicated that you'll be receiving monthly reports. Yes. I come from real estate. Monthly reports for repairs or capital needs is not sufficient. That would mean, in essence, a month to two months can go by without you realizing there is a repair at, that's needed and not being addressed. You have to come up with a... We get phone calls and emails on a daily basis when a repair 
needs to be made, but I think by having monthly reporting, we'll have the full picture because there may be things that have not come to our attention. So, so it's really a, I, a I just, safety I just want to share a scenario with you, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, let's say you have a report on November 30th, December 1st. We have a repair. You will not know about that repair, in essence, till December 31st, that it hasn't gone addressed, which would, I would imagine, then trigger some kind of investigation after you have the next report and you have time to go through it and follow up. In essence, you can have months go by on the basic and simplest of repairs that somehow just fell through the cracks. I come out of real estate. We never had monthly reports. It was daily reports. And you tracked repairs. And it became the responsibility and the burden of the managers to respond as quickly as possible. So, so what I would what I'd say is, as, as, the, as the commissioner said, we, 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 we communicate daily. Um, our point person, Carl Walton, and DIFTA's point people on repairs. The, the monthly report, we think, and look, we can, we can modify it as, as we feel it is helpful. Uh, our, our staff, our, our, you know, DIFTA is not in the, in, the, in the business of property management, and we, we, are, we are managing those repairs. We are in daily conversation with, with our, pa our partners in DIFTA. The report is meant to be able to give a, a wide view of, of what is going on to make sure that if there are, if there are things slipping through the cracks. But the, 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 the monthly reports are not a replacement for those daily conversations. You bring up something interesting. You just said DIFTA is not in the management business and the repair business, but yet you are. If you're not, then we have real problems. If you're not in the management business, you're not in the repair business, what business are you in? So uh, what, I w what I was saying was that NYCHA is in the asset management and repair business. Mm -hmm. DIFTA is in the management business, and we, and, they, and we work closely with them on monitoring and communicating as repairs are needed. But I'm, what I'm saying is that, we, we ha that the reports do not replace the daily phone calls. God help our seniors. God help NYCHA. I don't know what else we can do for them because we never get an answer. We, we see n no proactive approach to the issues, and it's unfortunate and there's nothing on the horizons. I can't wait till we privatize the management of NYCHA and get rid of the whole lot of you. Council member, uh, thank you for your questions. But I, before uh, Council member Trigg, oh, we've been joined by uh, Council member Torres. I do wanna say something positive, right? Because yesterday in my district, we had a tour with uh, the general manager, Vito, uh, Mr. Chulo, and with the staff, and the respond time to heat and hot water has greatly improved since last year. And that took a lot of work in terms of organizing personnel, putting more staff on site, working with the management and development. And so what I hear and what I see uh, from my constituent, I'm happy that there are quicker results. So it means that things can be done. But you gotta focus and you have to put the resources there. And so coordination between NYCHA and, and DIFTA has to be better, that fixing the centers has to be priority. And you have to figure a way, how do we make sure that when repairs are needed, that it doesn't get to that state. So I have confidence that you can work it out because I've seen it, all right? Uh, so we just hope that it just, keep on going the, the right way. Um, and we're here to support um, the council. We've been supporting a lot of our centers, and we wanna make sure that our seniors are taken care of. So we're, we're willing to be your partner, and let's work together and just make the lives of our senior better. Where they live, where they go on a, on a daily to the senior center, where they're gonna have fun. We wanna make sure they, they are in a good place. Um, so, Council Member Traeger, follow up with question. Thank you uh, to both chairs for holding this very important and I think timely hearing. Um, 
I, I just uh, would like to say that I think that my frustration and my concerns about the, uh, the pace and the slow pace of Sandy recovery is probably well documented by now. Um, but I'd like to bring uh, to uh, NYCHA's and DIFTA's attention an issue that I think that both agencies should be aware of already because I've been in touch with the uh, provider and, and uh, seniors from the center. Um, Haber House is in Coney Island. Um, as we're still undergoing Hurricane Sandy recovery work, um, it was brought to my attention that the seniors there, and I'd just like to point out to my colleagues and to the public, the seniors there are predominantly, uh, these are Holocaust survivors, World War II veterans. These are very, very vulnerable, fragile seniors who are just trying to enjoy the, the golden years of their lives and spending time with each other, have no heat whatsoever in the center. NYCHA has been called down. Um, I was told that folks came down and did not make any repairs and just left leaving them in the lurch and in the dark about what's happening. Um, so they are cold. It is cold outside today, and uh, you know we talk a lot about making sure we, have, we avoid social isolation, we avoid, uh, which is another an issue that, that the chair has talked a lot about and worked on. Um, this center is life for these seniors. This is a place for them to um, really has extended their life. And so I would like to get some sort of clear picture about when will the heat be restored to the center. Secondly, I'm hearing that, uh, and, and NYCHA is doing work here, so I'm not clear why this is happening, but there is significant flooding happening in the building, and when it, uh, the, flood, the flood water, um, uh, sorry, when it rains, water from the, uh, the roof is leaking down to the center, causing flooding, and there are security cameras NYCHA's cameras have been damaged, so there's no even, there's no uh, information about whether they're being repaired, when they're being repaired. Um, so there's leaks. You have no heat. But what gets me is that NYCHA, you know, received $3 billion from FEMA years ago where a lot of basic repairs and work should have been done already. But I, I would just like to get an answer from NYCHA and DIFTA. Uh, what is the status of getting heat back to Haber houses? And what's the status of repairing these chronic leaks that they're suffering from as well? Um, hold, on, hold on one second. We will, we're, we're, we're working on it right now and we'll get you an answer in the, you know, right now. So we'll let us, let us have our folks reach out to some folks and we'll, we'll get back to you. I, I mean, I would like an answer today. Yeah, no, no, if we can get, if we're, we will reach out now and if we can get an answer to you like in the next couple of minutes, we'll, we'll get that to you. And I, I also think it's important that you hold your staff accountable in the sense if they come down there because they, or, or a complaint was made Folks did come down, didn't do anything, and didn't even speak to anybody. So it's unacceptable. So just basic decency, communication, let the senior center director know, uh, let, the, let the staff know what's going on. So in addition to making the repair, we need to talk to staff about, you know, treating people with some basic respect. It's unacceptable. So I, I would, I'm going to follow up with folks here, because I would like an answer today and the repair should be made immediately. Uh, anything from DIFTA is, is, or the commissioner on, on this issue? Yeah. Oh, just, I guess I just wanted to um, let you know that we received an email from the program yesterday about the heat. We reached out to NYCHA, NYCHA responded right away um, with some questions about ticket numbers and also indicating that they were following up right away. So I can't speak to the on-site experience, but I just kind of wanted to give you that as an example of the way it does work. Um, emails were flying around yesterday about this, so hopefully well, that will help. But I just want, you know, again, the definition of follow-up is mm -hmm. sending someone not to do anything. 
Yeah, no, understood. So it's just, it's just not acceptable. These are people that are still dealing with a lot of other issues in the community. This, got, this has to be resolved as soon as possible. And I'll be following up with NYCHA uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I have a, a question for NYCHA. I'm, I'm curious to know the difference between the repair process and DYCD overseeing centers versus TIFTA overseeing centers. My understanding is that DYCD has its own capital fund. Is that correct? DYCD has about $2 million in expense funding to handle um, basic repairs. Is there a comparable program with DIFTA? Not, a, not at this moment. That's part of the ongoing conversations about the MOU, but we go ahead and make those repairs, um, and if we can't pay for them within our budget, then we go to OMB to ask for funding. So we do it sort of on a pay-as-we-go basis. And since DIFTA is overseeing the operation of these centers, NYCHA is the owner, but DIFTA is effectively the operator or the contractors that you hire operating these centers, who's responsible for addressing the capital needs of these centers? Is it, is it the city or is it NYCHA? What is the de Blasio administration's position on that? So we've been discussing this. Um, Right now, our arrangement with NYCHA is that when it's a capital building-wide kind of out of outside the envelope kind of situation, then NYCHA um, makes the repair. And if it's something that's more of a minor repair within the senior center, then we work with the sponsor to make sure there's funding to do that. If it's painting or replacing tiles or um, Even though plumbing. The well, the minor repairs stem from the larger capital needs. So as long as then, those capital needs persist, you're going to be throwing money into an abyss. Exactly. So the question is, so, but the position of the de Blasio administration is that it's NYCHA's obligation to meet. What's the overall capital need of all your centers? The, of, all, of all of our centers, so the community, I'm going to bring Deborah Goddard up, but the, the broadly, well, let me have Deborah explain what the overall need for our community centers are. Good afternoon, council member. Um, overall, the need for our community centers, um, discrete needs, which means just relates to what's inside the four walls, is about half a billion dollars. But as I was saying earlier, that's not the entire need because, again, if it's a heating plant issue or a roof issue, um, those needs are embedded in uh, the PNA inside the the PNA for the building or the development. Um, so. It's well beyond half a billion dollars. And you scarcely have enough funding for the most essential needs of your portfolio. So like what, at what capital funding can you allocate to address the half a billion dollars worth of minimal capital needs at your community centers? Um, as you well know, we probably, we, we apply the same order of work. So if it is a roof, um, well, if it's a roof in the building, it gets attention. If it's a roof solely for the senior center, it's not going to rise to the level of the roof over our residential units. Um, uh, we do pay attention, again, to things like heating systems. Um, but it's fair to say that you essentially have no capital budget for your we have, community centers. We have very little capital available outside of the discretionary funding okay. that the council gives us. Thank you. Okay, so if the position of the de Blasio administration is that it's NYCHA's responsibility, and we know NYCHA has no capital funding for the needs of the community centers, then it seems like everyone here is just content to say there's nothing we can do. That these buildings are gonna be in an ever state of deepening disrepair, there's no funding to take care of them. Is that, is that a fair characterization of? I, I, I think it's harsh. I understand why you might articulate it that way, but I think that's harsh. I don't think any of us have given up on trying to find out how to address the capital needs, but you are right. We simply do not have the $32 billion we need right now. We don't have a solution for it. Um, but even though the city, through DIFTA and DYCD, routinely operates your centers, there's no commitment from the city to addressing the capital needs of those centers. I think for the city, we've prioritized the roofs and the boiler work. And as you know, there's been significant investment from the city in those two items. Well, 
well, significant investment for the general portfolio, but not right. for the community centers, right? The right. subject of today's hearing is the community centers. There's right. been no all commitment. All I'm from saying the city. is we've prioritized roofs and heating systems across our portfolio. Now, NYCHA made a decision in 2015 to, prior, to privatize the operation of the centers, right? To transfer control from the authority to DIFTA and DYCD, right? That was about four years ago, or nearly four years ago, maybe three and a half years ago. Why only now are you beginning the process of formulating an MOU? Right? We've known for years, and David Priston and I have had multiple conversations, that there was a lack of clarity about who was responsible for what. That not-for-profits were constantly receiving violations from the Department of Health, and it was not clear whether the Department of uh, DIFTA was responsible for the repairs or NYCHA was responsible for the repairs. That was four years ago, and now you're beginning the process of delineating roles and responsibilities. Why did it take so long? So we have, I mean, the, the MOU is still in process, that being said. I and it's not, even a fi it's not even done. The MOU you're, you're, not. Only, you're in the midst of creating an MOU, but it's not even done four years later. So, so yes, we, the MOU is not done, and we are continuing to work towards it um, between us, uh, DIFTA, and OMB. Um, w but that doesn't mean that we, ha we have been having ongoing conversations and have, f and have formalized um, the processes and some of the standard, you know, kind of procedures we take when um, addressing, you know, the various repair needs. So we, ha we have now have a better understanding of at what point does the provider work with DIFTA to secure a vendor, um, and at what point does NYCHA, is NYCHA responsible for repairs. So uh, we, we have, we have, what do you mean by formalize? Is it in writing? We have, I mean, we, 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 it's we in have, practice. I mean, it's a, yeah, yes, it's in practice. So we don't, it's not all, it's but not known a, only to the agency insiders and not to the rest of us. Well, right? and, and we, no, and, we, and to our network of correct. providers. Has, it, has something in writing been given to that here are the roles and responsibilities in no, relation? No, this is not memorialized yet in an MOU, oh. but in practice we have a very effective working relationship and our sponsors know to reach out to us, they reach out to NYCHA, and we work collaboratively to make sure that the repairs are made. Okay, I just, I'm sure we've all heard complaints from not-for-profits. I think your perception of what you characterize an effective working relationship is quite different from what I've heard from not-for-profits. Uh, my, my time is over, but I just, it baffles me that it's taken so long to even begin the process of defining who's responsible for one, for what, after four years after transferring control of these centers to DIFTA and DYCD. I think I, I wanted to follow up with that, is that from our last hearing about the capital needs of the centers, this DIFTA working with the provider, is there a, an assessment of each center's capital need? I mean, if we have that assessment, then we can advocate for a capital budget. I mean, right now, DIFTA doesn't have a capital budget, right? So if you have a capital budget, and if that capital budget uh, came from working with provider to make an assessment. Okay, this center needs to repair X, Y, and Z, and they need this much money. And then we can go to the administration and advocate so that repairs gets done, and the center can also be upgraded. I mean, yeah, we start with, with the repair, but a lot of center, they really need to get upgrade. Make it nicer for our seniors. So we need to know, so does DIFTA, are you starting that process in terms of what the real capital needs are for the center? Can you give us um, that request number so that we have an idea and that, that we can help fight for a capital budget for DIFTA? NYCHA is going to have to answer that question. And so from the DIFTA side, no, we are not it's not in our purview to do that. This is a NYCHA responsibility. But that's only for, you're talking about for all the centers that DIFTA operate in NYCHA, right? Okay, but somebody, right? You are working together. So it'll be great if you can come up with the capital need for each of these centers that are operating in NYCHA facility so that we can work with DIFTA 
because you provide the oversight to these centers that you should have a capital budget to take care of these centers. Is that part of the MOU? No, I think at this point, going back to what I said earlier, um, for the capital needs, which is not upgrade, as I mentioned before, um, just replay, replace in kind, um, our physical needs assessment is the guiding document, um, but again, it has a couple of complications. One being it is not an upgrade, which a lot of, are, it, true, a lot of centers want upgrades, new kitchens, cooking facilities. Um, more importantly, a lot of the capital needs may be a heating system or the sewage system, and that's going to be part of a much, that's part of that $32 billion. I, I, I know, I keep hearing that $32 billion. Well, it's, but it's, that, it's, that is the larger capital need. But meanwhile, but, I think working with DIFTA, there's got to be some also immediate relief, immediate solution <coughs> to really working with the center. And we're going to hear from the centers. This, if, if this may, cannot be like, oh, it's such a complicated, difficult problem, and we can't get a handle on it. But if I may, let me go back to the concrete example. Um, they mentioned overheating at Smith houses. Um, that's a heating plant issue, right? That can't be solved just inside the four walls. I understand that, but that also, in that center, they are also coming to me asking for capital dollar to upgrade their kitchen. Now, DIFTA should have that in your capital budget, but you don't have a capital budget. You should have a capital budget. So that's what I'm saying with each center to really assess what their needs are and how can we all work together to meet that need. That's all I'm asking is to really sit down with the centers that you have oversight. Let's look at what the capital needs are, what is that dollar amount, so that we have something to work with to help fight for that budget that you need. Yeah. Question. Have you received a list from some of your partners that work in senior centers about the capital repair needs? Have you received a list? Yes, we get ongoing requests from our providers and we, we do track them and we have a list and as we have funding, we go ahead and make, put in new kitchens, So Nigel, have repairs. you received that list? Oh, we don't have any regular lists, no. Okay, Weibo. We don't have a list of requests from providers, no. Have you ever sat down with your partners that operate senior centers and come up with a process or language that would work towards the MOU from each of, okay, let me just, UNH, just using them as an example. Have you sat down with UNH and has UNH provided you with lists of their capital repair needs for the senior centers that they actually work in? And have you utilized that list to come up with a process that will work towards the MOU? Because to my understanding, you have. So I, I feel like that you're at, you're, the, the questions that you're asking the two agencies are slightly different questions. The question that you're asking DIFTA is, do you have the wish list of the things you'd like to upgrade to be able to provide adequate, adequate or, or, or upgraded services? So to, that's different. So that's different. And that's why so, I asked so we, NYCHA. So, we, so, we, so we, have, we, have, we have not received that list. What we have received, and we sat down with UNH and other providers, is where are there, if there are violations, if there are you know things that are related to infrastructure that we've gotten we we've we've gotten that list from them and we've calculated and that's that those are a lot of that stuff is in, included in the PNA it's good sometimes and what did you do with that what did we do with that yes. we i mean at the time we had calculated we had basically it had helped us look at what was the physical needs of to get the going back to what um De Deborah, um, our you know, executive vice president, Deborah Goddard had explained, was what does it take to get the um, centers into a state of good repair mm -hmm. in, in accordance with the PNA. We also looked at, at the time we were also- So that's separate, that's PNA, that's separate from a wish list, right? right? So continue on those lines. 
So then we'd also had conversations about um, what, at the, t at the time this was part of our ongoing conversation with DIFTA about what does it take for the ongo ongoing break and fix maintenance of the, of the centers. And that's what has led to this now, on, this, this kind of clarifying of understanding of where the, of where we break out um, the break and fix simple repairs within the four walls of the center um, that is, or, that is, addressed by the provider with DIFTA's help in identifying a vendor to address the issue um, and the larger infrastructure issues that are dealt with by NYCHA. And then once you have that information and that intel, how does that get incorporated into a draft of an MOU document that would eventually come to so, some kind of so, a... So the MOU would memori memorialize the practice that we, have, that we currently have in place. So who's at the table when you have conversations around this MOU? It is, it's NYCHA, DIFTA, and OMB. Who in OMB? I mean, it's a, it's a, it, look, there, there are a number of folks who have eyes on this. It includes folks who are involved in the funding of both agencies. It's, in, it's also, there's also, le you know, there's legal, legal teams on both sides who review this. Um, and then there's the program people who are actually doing the work. So there's a number of people across all three agencies who all are contributing to the MOU and the conversation. So within NYCHA, who is at the table working on this? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a combination of real estate operations and, you know, and, and, and Yuka's team and our, and our legal team. Okay, so since this started four years ago, and we know that there was some information that was received in Intel and um, work with the, the senior program operators two years ago. So where are you now with the actual document? I understand ongoing, but what does ongoing mean? Like, is there an actual draft that is in place and the legal teams are reviewing this draft or does the draft already complete it and it was submitted to the administration and council's looking over it? Like, so where are you with this actual document four years later? I mean, there are, there are elements that are more finalized than others. For instance, the practice of the repairs. There are, element, there are other elements that are, that are much less, that are not for as far along as they need That's to be. That's not helpful, seriously, because it just sounds like a bunch of talk. And I mean, I keep hearing ongoing and people are talking and discussions and that is saying absolutely nothing. And so I'm just simply asking, where are you with the draft and what does that actually mean? So we don't, we don't have a, we don't have a draft that could be shared at this moment. I'm not asking for to, to look at the draft. I'm asking what, what does it look like? Like what, where are you in this? Is it, is it just some concepts that are on a piece of paper and people are thinking, okay, we're still gathering ideas. Is it actual, a, a document where the legal teams are looking to see like parse out responsibilities? Can you explain to us where you are in the stage of this MOU agreement four years later? Because right, right now, everything that we have said, it has gone back to the MOU or some concept of a, of a procedure or responsibilities. And, and, and you even said in your statement, like it was, it was enough for you to say in your opening remarks that this MOU is, is ongoing discussions. And so we know that this is a, a serious issue. So where are you in that process? We are not at the point where legal or legal or city hall is reviewing the MOU. We are still working out the elements that need to be that need to be formalized, and we are still drafting those pieces. So, I mean, technically, we could be here again next year saying the same thing. I mean, this. Yeah. Where's the commitment? Or, or like, where's the priority that? You know everything that's happening. We like there should be a formal agreement and and um, defined and cleared responsibilities and roles as to who does what because the 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 issues that we're seeing is because of all the confusion as to who's responsible for what. I mean it's easy to continue to go back and say well there's a 32 billion dollar need. Yeah we know that, but we got to figure out parts out who's responsible for what so that the administration so that we can put in the ask of the administration or figure out how we can do this. I mean, we just wanted to be helpful, right? Because the centers are coming to us. 
asking, or we're asking them, what are your capital needs? What can we be helpful with? I remember one of the center I was talking about their bathroom, they have a kitty bathroom for seniors. Finally, I think DIFTA got some money um, and got it done. But I have other centers in NYCHA and they definitely can use improvement. So we gotta, we gotta find a way to work together and fight for that money that our senior deserve, okay? When I talk to DIFTA about your capital need, hey, you deserve that money. Our senior deserve that money. So come on, you know, we, we don't want it just every year by year, and those senior centers that in, in DIFTA right now, we don't know what to do with them, or some of them you have some idea they could turn into NORCs, or what about the rest of them? We gotta make sure that they're taken care of, right? If the administration don't put in the three million, then the council, we probably have to fight to, to put in some funding, because we don't want the seniors to lose the resources. So here we go again, right? And I just don't sense that urgency. Like when we look at that picture, that is definitely unacceptable for a site, you know, where senior have daily activity or they have lunch or whatever, and the ceiling is falling down. We, you heard from some of the provider earlier, and we're gonna hear from more provider. Do you wanna go to a place like that? I don't. That's unacceptable, and we got to find a way to fix it. Yes, you got to fix the roof and all that, and but meanwhile, there's got to be some short-term repair that could be done. And so I know that's a big ask about 32 billion, but if we can help at least temporarily make the place safe for our senior, we got to do that. So I, I, hear the, I hear the frustration and we are committed to and have prioritized fin finalizing the MOU and we, I think as two agencies, definitely see the value in having, the, you know, having this formalized. I think that being said, I'd, I'd like to be clear that we do, we do currently, without an MOU, without, you know, <laughs> without, without um, a you know, specific baseline amount of funding, we as the two, two agencies are both committed to addressing any repairs that, we, that, we, that, are, that, are, that are identified, that are called in through the CCC or are brought to either agency um, by a council member, by a director, a provider, by a, by a participant at a, at a center. Um, and particularly when it comes to health and safety, we, we prioritize those and you know, look, there, are there instances where we, where we don't get it right I'm sure there are, and this might be one of them, and we'll need to look at this, but we, it is a priority, and our folks take it very seriously, and they go, they go to the, it's, if it's health and safety, regardless of where it is, if it's an apartment or if it's in a center, it goes to the top of the chain. And I think one of the, the, the point that uh, my co-chair made earlier about providers getting fined, you know, for violations, so, and if they have to, you know, raise money on their own to take care of it, that, that's not acceptable either. So what are you do, working, I mean, are you working with the uh, Department for the Buildings uh, when they come in and they issue fine to the CBOs? Can you help them resolve those issues? Because it's, it's not their fault that, the, that there was a, the violation that exists in the building. Yeah, so one, I wanna go back because I do hear your frustration and I share your frustration and we hear from our providers on a daily basis, but I really want to reassure you that every day repairs and upgrades are being made in our NYCHA senior centers. So, I, you know, please don't leave thinking that we are just in a state of disrepair and that work is not going on all the time. Um, I've gotten to visit some of the programs that are have been the result of upgrades. I know Hudson Guild is one of those that's building out a beautiful new site and center. So there are some great things that are happening as well. Um, on the fines, they, the provider will bring that to our attention. In many cases, we can step in and because of our relationship with buildings and others, we can get that fine relieved or the financial penalty. Um, and the same on the NYCHA side. Sometimes there are 
fines that are the responsibility of the provider. Um, I don't know if you can give an example of that. And it, you know, if that's the case, and we can't justify that it was you know on on the part of NYCHA as manager or DIFTA, then there might be instances where a fine would have to be paid by the sponsor. Yeah. Let me just, um, so what I would like for you to get back to me on is, so Fort Greene Senior Council, that's one of the providers in my district, mm -hmm. and they have a $5,000 fine, mm -hmm. and it's based on issues around the place of assembly and things that they actually have no um, control over. And so they are the ones that actually had to have bake sales and fundraising efforts to be able to um, uh, um, pay off this debt. So uh, if somebody can speak to that because I, I know that that is an issue and they were at a panic state. We will. Do you know which center? It was between um, Blemen House, it was between Blemen Center and um, Kingsborough Extension. It was Reed. Reed. Okay. Blemen. Yeah. Reed. Okay. And I'll also say, since you mentioned Reed, and I know my, um, the previous colleagues had uh, issues around sewage, when you walk into um, Reed houses, when you walk into Blemen, there's a strong sewer smell and everyone just kind of um, sprays Lysol and um, burn incense and candles and um, potpourri everywhere and go into the center and just act like it's not there because they love going to the center, but there's a sewage problem. And this is something that they've complained about for some time, and they are also the ones that have this $5,000 fine. So you can explain that one. That's an example. We'll get, we'll, get, we'll get back to you on that one. I do know our design department was working with them to resolve the public assembly issue. I'm not sure about the fine, but we'll get back to you. Uh, so, so on this one, we, I mean, th this, uh, we have to look into what, what exactly the nature of this fine is, and, but generally in a situation like this, we, the, the agent, one of these two agencies, we would take care of the fine. So we will touch base with you, your staff, and and and, and the Fort Greene Senior Council, and we'll figure out what's if, if something has you know what's going on here. Um, since we're talking about the providers, um, there was a mention of the um, zone model. Um, new concept and process. So can you um, just give us some information about around what's happening with the zone model, um, just some updates, and how many um, senior providers are um, um, part of this zone model method, and um, how many seniors have they been able to service? Sure. So, um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for the question. and. So we divided the city into 15 geographic zones. Um, each zone is about 11,000 units and may serve two to three community districts. Um, currently, all the zones are fully staffed, so we have about four coordinators in each zone. Um, we have one from our resident economic empowerment and sustainability department, and they focus on economic um, asset building for our residents. And under our resident engagement department, we have zone coordinators assigned to seniors, youth, and resident leaders. And so they engage. For purposes of time and everything else, we're, can you just talk to us about the Senior. zone model with seniors only? Sure. So to date, we have touched over 35,000 residents with our zone model. We have 16 zone partners that are formalized, meaning once we have um, they're in a system, property management can make referrals to these agencies um, where seniors have a need, whether it's for case management, uh, home care services, or any other senior needs. So we're not in, in the, pro we're not in a computerized system as of yet, but we're working with IT to have this computerized. So a manager could say, I'm referring to this resident for social services, and that referral can go directly to the agency who's our zone partner. They were vetted. They, we have an MOU with them, they have the necessary insurance, and residents will have to consent to receive these services. Um, right now, we're starting to do it a, a, as a manual process, but we hope by the late 2019, we will have this in the system and it's model after our REIS um, database system that's now 
adding the function to track outcomes. So we will, we're benefiting from that database. So um, our- So it's not a, a, a full system that's up and running. This is manual and it's, it's still like in the pilot? The REIT system is fully up and running and they actually um, added the outcome component. Ours are, is not for the human services um, I'm section. I'm only talking about the seniors. Yes, it's not up and running completely yet. Okay, and the 35,000 residents that you've touched um, under this um, model, are the 35,000 out of the 80,000 seniors? Yeah, well, yes. Well, but we, could have, so we could have some seniors that are not just NYCHA residents. It, it's not, if a senior come to us for service, we won't turn them away, but we do um, work with all seniors, yes. So it is out of the 80 plus thousand seniors. The 35,000 yes. residents that you yes. touched. I just, I just want to clarify, by, the, the system is up and running. It is not computerized, and obviously it will be more efficient once it's computerized, but the referrals are happening right. and, and the connections are being made. So I just want to clarify that point. Uh, Reese, you know, we, we got, we've gotten a, um, a significant amount of funding from foundations and others to support uh, the, autom the, uh, the automation of those re that referral process. So um, this is something that our we're, 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 that our IT team is doing on its own. Um, so that, that's why the systems are not necessarily synced up as far as like where they are in the um, kind of you know, the auto the automating process. So the 16 zone partners that you refer to are they? Um, um organizations that work exclusively with seniors or are they like organizations that provide different services to other residents like um, someone that does um, um, I don't know, uh, IT Right, so the training. 16 partners that I mentioned are for seniors, they focus on seniors, they may do it citywide, but we do have additional partners. We accepted 30 partners in our, but these 16 focus on senior services. Okay, so on the zone model, can you give us some information? Because it was like, it was the first time we heard about it. Um, in terms of the breakdown of the, by council district, sure. so that we know which nonprofit that you're working with. Uh, are you working with our, the developments in our district so that we could share with our other colleagues? Absolutely, All right. we'll share it out with you. So we are gonna send you questions that we didn't get a chance to ask, uh, and we'll, expects response back because we wanted to hear from the providers and um, we thank you for being here today and I just wanted to stress we want to be a strong partner with you because we want to provide the best services to our seniors and so we look forward to to work with you and with the MOU if you need us to help push with OMB we will to get it done because it's taking far too long thank you thank you we thank appreciate you. your partnership thank you Next, we'll hear from Loris Green, Brownsville, Beatrice Haley, Harlem River, Emily Batista, and Betty Mina. Hey, Ms. Green.
Caitlin from Live On New York, Tyra Klein from United Neighborhood Houses, and Alexander Riley, Legal Aid. You may begin. My name, is, my name is Loris Green from the Brownsville Senior Center, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my issue is at the Brownsville Senior Center, we are trying to have a computer lab. Mm -hmm. We have a, we have a instructor. The problem is we doesn't have no kind of computer. So what we do to learn, we have to apply our own laptop, tablet, or phone. We, we have about 15 students, but then we doesn't have our, our tools. So if we get our tools, maybe our class could get um, bigger. And um, the scene is more concerned about um, if we could have more consultants to come in, which the director is trying, and we always have someone to come in. We have a food, we have a food plan that comes in five days a week. So hopefully next year we, we all would have a computer lab. Just a quick question. The um, computer lab that's attached to the teen center around the backs of the senior center, did you ever utilize that space prior to it becoming a teen center? We tried, but it didn't work. Okay. Uh, so hopefully maybe, mm -hmm. so um, hopefully maybe now that the teens doesn't utilize it in the day, there's a possibility that we could utilize it while they are not there. Because yeah. normally they come in the afternoon and the senior center is open from nine to five. Okay. Thank you. This is one of the social clubs, according to DIFTA, but not, but a senior center, according to NYCHA, is a social club because it's small, but it's not small. We will definitely work with NYCHA, because um, I know senior loves computers, so right. we, we can, in the city council, we can look at uh, other <laughs> source of funding that will be able to help uh, make that happen. But thank you for being here today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Emily Batista, and I reside at the Frog's Neck Houses for Seniors. Can you bring the mic closer to you? Oh, sorry. I um, reside at the Senior Houses in Frog's Neck since 2016. Um, we have a family partnership program at NYCHA which I'd never utilized the services until recently. That all changed when I met our uh, family worker, Mrs. Pons. She made me feel comfortable and showed concerns regarding the issues that as seniors we faced in the community. Mrs. Pons goes above and beyond and is responsible and devoted to the senior community. It's a big plus to have her a, she's bilingual, and two, as I said, she's very concerned. She's always there to listen to us, even if we just come in to vent about the weather, anything, she's willing to listen. So her being there has had a big impact on only not me, but as well as the other seniors, when we discuss our repairs, our dilemmas with other issues in the building going on. Currently we have, um, and that's not on my notes, but I figured I'd bring it out. We have asbestos in the building. We have leaks, we have mold. Um, on my floor alone, there's a ceiling that, in the hallway community area, it came down. They had to bring it down because it was cracking and falling and it leaks. So now they have it covered with a plastic like that. 
um, I have a breathing condition and that mold is not gonna help. So we need uh, that address. So I've gone to Ms. Pond's office to see how we can work together to get that done. She's also made an impact on, my mother was recently displaced because of Hurricane Maria. So I brought her to live with me and she helped me obtain services for my mom, such as Medicaid, health services, or just a little talk with her because she's in a place that after 40 years she didn't reside in. Um, so again, it's important that we have these partnerships because we can work together. And again, Jahaira, I'd like to thank you personally for all that you do for us. I'm sorry. Um, she's committed and we need programs like this to continue without night throughout NYCHA. Thank you. Thank you. So is she, uh, is Ms. Pons a social worker at the center? She's a caseworker, case, case management. Worker. She's here. Do you know if she works for NYCHA or she works for the senior center? But we, uh, we could find out. Oh, you wanna come back on record and answer? <laughs> that, that, that's okay. Okay, it's the part of a program in NYCHA. See, we hear good things about NYCHA, right? So with good programs like that, we need to continue the support because it makes a difference. Absolutely. Uh, and it helps the seniors there. And recently it was uh, in jeopardy of being lost because of contract issues or whatever with NYCHA. So I'm making sure that this continues. I'm not gonna let it go. Um, I'm also very active and vocal in my building and we're gonna see how we can work together to get some of these things addressed. Thank you, and thank you for being here. It's important for us, the committee, to hear from you, but also I would urge you reach out to your council member. Oh yeah, I have Mark Jonah and I have a very personal okay, so relationship. Make sure, make sure council member Jonah is on the case. Yeah, yeah he is. Thank you. He is, thank, thank you. you for being here. Next. Thank you, Chairs. My name is Caitlin Hosey. I'm here representing Live On New York. Our members are the 90 plus organizations that operate the more than 96 social services that operate in NYCHA. In New York City, NYCHA represents one of the largest suppliers of affordable housing for low income seniors. Currently about 38% of NYCHA households are headed by an individual that's age 62 or over, and an estimated 7,700 units are designated specifically for older adults. Just as the buildings are aging, so are the tenants in NYCHA that occupy them, making the need for quality, safe services in NYCHA paramount to the success of the community at large. Unfortunately, however, providers of services such as senior centers and NORCs that operate in NYCHA face daily challenges just to keep the doors open. Much emphasis has accurately been placed on the need to improve the living conditions and units within NYCHA developments, an emphasis that Live on New York wholly supports. However, it is imperative to recognize that senior service providers have not been immune to these capital and operational challenges. A recent Wall Street Journal article noted the estimated $500 million capital backlog that has been articulated today, and we know to be much greater than that number alone. Faulty HVACs, leaking roofs, Broken boilers and the occasional rodent are just a few of the challenges to which providers have limited control over mitigating. Adding salt to the wound, providers are often subject to an onslaught of fines and violations for these conditions from the city's well-intentioned regulatory agencies, including the Department of Health and Mental Health and the Fire Department. Providers are then often asked to fund these repairs out of their non-existent bottom lines. The fines and repair needs are exacerbated by the fact that NYCHA's approval process leaves providers waiting weeks, months, or even years before being able to move, for move forward with critical repairs, even those for which capital funds have already been made available, as a point that Debbie Rose made earlier today. The impacts of these fines and conditions are not only man monetary. Instead of spending crucial time with the tenants, these Individuals who went to become social workers are then forced 
to spend time becoming experts in areas that are wholly outside of their job description, such as how to m mitigate these issues that are wholly inappropriate for them to have to deal with. The impact cannot be understated. These providers work tirelessly to provide high quality services to those who need it most, and through these suboptimal processes, are being consistently hamstrung from meeting their city mandated and personally motivated obligations. Additionally, senior centers and services operating in NYCHA should be seen as resources in relaying critical information about NYCHA NextGen and RAD, and they need to be fully funded in their contracts to be able to meet these aims. We recognize that challenges are not specific to senior services, but run the gamut of community spaces in NYCHA facilities, which is why we are proud to have begun collaborating with the Daycare Council of New York and United Neighborhood Houses to recommend reforms across community spaces. Acknowledging the difficult financial position of NYCHA, we respectfully submit the following process-oriented recommendations, each having the potential to improve the day-to-day -day business and viability of providers operating within NYCHA without adding additional stress to NYCHA's current financial situation. Redirecting fines, nonprofit human service providers should, who lack site control and rely on NYCHA to make repairs should not be subject to citations and fines from DOMH DOHMH or FDNY due to the failure to make these repairs for which they have submitted requests. When these violations are found during inspections and if these have been reported to NYCHA by the provider, the provider should not be penalized. Dedicate staff. As is the practice in other governmental agencies, there must be an individual within the Department for the Aging whose sole focus is to liaise with NYCHA and to support and streamline processes for DIFTA-funded services located in NYCHA developments. Increased transparency. Providers must be given access to an up-to-date NYCHA-approved vendor list in order to expedite the procurement process. Mandate interagency cooperation. NYCHA and the agencies that leverage their space, including DIFTA, need a clear division of responsibilities for the maintenance and upkeep of NYCHA sites. In order to provide stability to providers, this division of responsibility, once established and agreed upon, should be standardized as appropriate across all agencies that fund providers operating out of NYCHA properties. And finally, de design of an approval process for repairs. NYCHA must work internally and with providers to accelerate the approval for repairs and renovations and must expedite processes within the residential repair division when floods leaks or other issues originate in apartments and require a two-pronged repair to fully address. We thank you for your time and for listening to our recommendations. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chin and Chair Ampre Samuel for convening today's hearing. My name is Tara Klein and I'm a policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses, UNH. Uh, thank you for mentioning us earlier. Uh, Council Member and Pre Samuel. Um, many of our recommendations, um, I won't read them all. Uh, Caitlin covered them. We are working in collaboration with Live On and the Daycare Council of New York to address uh, issues in community centers that are run by NYCHA. Um, but I will skim through some of my testimony uh, today. So, uh, first, un uh, unfortunately, many of the city senior centers located within NYCHA facilities and operated by DIFTA are in need of some very serious repairs, as we've heard today. Reports of leaking roofs, dilapidated kitchen appliances, and broken air conditioners, many that are also designated as official New York City cooling centers, are all too common. Heating, plumbing, and electrical systems often need major overhauls. Many of these centers are located in decades-old buildings, which tends to make these challenges even more frequent and extreme. We've heard that NYCHA needs over $500 million for repairs to its senior and community centers. And in the context of NYCHA's $32 billion need, uh, the upkeep of senior centers in NYCHA facilities run by community-based organizations has become a back burner priority, leaving many centers in need of basic facilities and maintenance resources. Distressingly, conditions continue to deteriorate for, with no clear plan for remediation. And unsurprisingly, Poor building conditions have a direct negative impact on attendance at senior centers, with older adults preferring not to spend their time in a building that is in disrepair. Uh, so given NYCHA's capital repair backlog for its overall building stock, 
Providers who used to rely on the agency to make repairs have been forced to look for other solutions to their pressing repair needs. Because funding for repairs and renovations are generally not included in DIFTA senior center contracts, programs must secure funding outside of the regular contract process. This can be a time consuming and confusing process, especially as many projects arise as emergencies. There is not a clear amount of money in DIFTA's expense budget for repairs, as we heard earlier and as was reported uh, in the October uh, aging committee hearing on senior center repairs. So this makes it very difficult to assert whether this funding is sufficient to meet the needs uh, and to what extent NYCHA senior centers can benefit from this DIFTA fund. Uh, in practice, many programs cover their costs through their own limited budgets or private philanthropic sources or will put off repairs until the city can produce funding. And this can affect a center's overall programming. DIFSA can be inconsistent with their criteria for reimbursing providers for repairs that they pay for out of their own pocket, if DIFTA is willing to reimburse at all. While we've seen that other agencies like DYCD have procedures in place for reimbursing for emergency repairs. Next, even when the senior center providers are able to procure the necessary funding to make needed repairs, NYCHA's approval process and protocol can prevent them from moving forward with projects for weeks, months, or years in some cases, as Caitlin just mentioned. Requests wind through NYCHA's approval process while capital dollars sit unused and conditions worsen. To make matters worse, there's a lack of internal coordination in NYCHA between the residential repair department and those who are responsible for repairs at senior centers. Consequently, when a leak originates from a residential apartment, UNH's members in senior centers can spend thousands of dollars, often their own privately raised funds, replacing ceilings, floors, and walls, only to have the same area flood again because the leak in the toilet or shower upstairs was never actually repaired or was repaired incorrectly. Uh, ultimately, programs are faced with a very impossible choice, working with NYCHA, finding the money elsewhere in their budget, or very often putting off critical repairs. Uh, next, uh, in addition to interrupting services for older adults, waiting for repairs exposes providers to possible fines from the city's oversight authorities. A common experience is a senior center requesting a repair from NYCHA, and while waiting for the work to start, receiving a citation or a fine from a different city agency, such as the Department of Health or the Fire Department. Uh, for example, one senior center uh, operated by Bronx Works, the E. Roberts Moore Center, uh, and in a NYCHA building, submitted a ticket to NYCHA to repair a crack in their wall. And while they were waiting for NYCHA to respond and make the repair, uh, the DIFTA program officer issued a citation for the crack, despite seeing the repair ticket that existed. So in these types of cases, the city is in effect fining itself. Uh, so moving on to our recommendations, um, you have them in front of you and Caitlin just uh, ran through them. We echo those concerns. Uh, in addition, uh, UNH is also recommending increasing the amount of money that the city makes available for senior center repairs and upgrades, uh, and senior centers should be eligible for this funding whether or not they're located in NYCHA buildings. Uh, first, this, uh, DIFTA should establish a dedicated capital repair fund, as uh, many of us have said today, uh, for senior center repairs and renovations. Uh, and we also recommend that the city council should establish a, a discretionary fund to support uh, flexible repair needs. Uh, for senior centers. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, to both committees for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Alex Riley. I'm the director of the Elder Law Practice for the Legal Aid Society. Um, as you may know, the Legal Aid Society has borough offices throughout the city and um, uh, we worked recently on uh, an annual basis, 300,000 uh, individual legal matters for low-income New Yorkers, civil, criminal, juvenile rights um, areas of practice. But uh, I'm uh, strictly in the civil practice. I'm based in uh, the Brooklyn Office for the Aging, where for decades uh, we've used a, a multidisciplinary ap approach with lawyers, social workers, paralegals to try to uh, allow older adults to age uh, safely at, at home. Um, the, the focus of today's hearing clearly is on physical in infrastructure and the physical 
uh, condition of the centers that, that have been discussed today. I, I wanted to make uh, brief comments about something slightly different because uh, uh, the, I mean, the general subject of the hearing is uh, services in, in for seniors in NYCHA. So what I wanted to speak about briefly was um, NYCHA rules and regulations that older adults need to abide by and uh, education about these things and assistance in, in compliance with respect to them. I will just mention uh, uh, briefly before that that uh, I've, having spent uh, my career focused on older adults and been out in the community a lot and spent a lot of time in senior centers, I've certainly come into personal contact with many of the kinds of conditions described here today. I, I used to run legal clinics at a couple of centers in Upper Manhattan, and every time I went, I, I was very distressed just to see the, the physical condition of some of these facilities, and I think it was Council Member Traeger earlier who used the words decency and respect. and. Certainly what you see in some of these locations uh, does not show respect to the people who, um, who are using these facilities really as their homes for many hours, five, uh, five days a week. Anyway, um, I, I, I'll be brief. Uh, Council Member Chin, um, in her introductory remarks, uh, did a great job of, of discussing just the and, and highlighting the, the sheer numbers of older adults who uh, call NYCHA home, uh, there are many uh, such older adults in NYCHA and the population is growing. Uh, some of them are there for many, many years. So there are multi-generational families in these, uh, in these homes um, and uh, certain family members come and go while the older adult ages and stays in place. Um, Many of these older adults uh, have a relatively limited education or limited English skills, um, and yet they're required to comply with uh, some fairly complex, in certain instances, rules governing their tenancies. Uh, and even if they uh, don't comply simply by failing to dot an I or cross a T, this can jeopardize uh, their tenancies. And we have seen this um, on many occasions in our practice, and. Uh, in the testimony that you have in, in front of you, we, uh, we've outlined one particular example, uh, an older man who had moved in with his uh, girlfriend um, of many years. Uh, they never got formally married, but they lived as husband and wife. Um, she became ill, and at, at some point she requested that he be added to the family composition, um, but she made some sort of error in the paperwork NYCHA denied this, but never told either her or him. Um, ultimately, and, and she died, uh, NYCHA moved to evict him. Thankfully, we were successful at a hearing in reversing this, but the hearing officer went out of her way in her decision to point out that NYCHA really needed to have done more to help the family, to have educated them. So really my point here today is to, to emphasize the need for greater education and assistance for older adults, whether that's to be provided by NYCHA staff um, in management offices or in the centers. I was very pleased to hear, I believe it was Ms. Baptiste, uh, praising somebody in the center who has been very helpful, and, and we certainly see that, individual employees who go out of their way to assist, but um, you know, they're, they're seeing people who come to them for help. Uh, the person, uh, the, the, the partner of our client who filled out the papers improperly, she didn't know she'd filled them out improperly. I mean, you don't know what you don't know, so to speak. So there really ought to be an opportunity for everyone on a regular basis to have education and assistance with prepare, complying with rules uh, that determine whether people can continue to live in their homes uh, in some cases uh, of many decades. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. And of course, uh, Live On and UNH, uh, we've been partnering. And thank you for your recommendation. And some of them we will definitely have to uh, pursue, especially in uh, the upcoming uh, budget negotiation. Uh, we agree that just it needs to have a capital budget. And even with NYCHA, they need to have the resources to do the repairs as necessary. And um, 500 million is a big number, but we can prioritize which are the critical ones that we can get some resources um, to get them fixed. 
And, um, and thank you to the senior who came today to tell your stories. And uh, it's so great to see you. And I know that you take advantage of our senior center. So we are gonna work very hard to make sure that you have the resources to keep the programs going and to expand. And we love it when senior wants to learn and especially wanna be uh, efficient in the computer. I have some senior in my district that loves their computer class and they keep asking for it year after year. So we're, we will be uh, fighting for more resources for you. So thank you all for being here. Okay, the, the last panel, uh, we have uh, Meyer Waxman from Self Help and Michael Higgin Jr. from the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice. Anyone else that want to testify, uh, please uh, fill out the form for the sergeant. <coughs> Thank you. Please begin. Uh, my name is Mayor Waxman. I am the managing uh, director of senior centers at Self Help Community Services. Thank you to the aging committee, Chair Margaret Chin, and the public housing chair, Alika Amprey Samuel, and the members of the committees for the opportunity to testify on senior services and senior centers in NYCHA. Uh, Self Help operates five senior centers throughout Queens, including one located in the community center of NYCHA's Latimer Gardens Complex in Flushing. There are unique needs within our Latimer Garden Senior Center, which serves more than 1,700 people each year. Together, our centers have over 10,000 members, and we serve over 200,000 meals each year. We strongly believe in the role that senior centers play in providing high-quality, nutritious meals, engaging activities, and health and wellness programming. In order to provide valuable services to the residents and to the community, NYCHA's Latimer Gardens has partnered with DIFTA, as well as with the Department of Youth and Community Development, and they're not-for-profit contractors to offer senior services and youth programs to the community. This partnership provides immense benefits to the local community. We are grateful for the Council's long-standing and ongoing support for senior centers and for always emphasizing the needs of older adults in policy decisions and budget allocations. In today's testimony, I'll focus on our experience operating a senior center in NYCHA's Latimer Gardens Complex. We are fortunate to have a collaborative relationship with the local NYCHA office. Our senior center staff has regularly scheduled meetings with NYCHA and has found the local office to be responsive and responsible. This partnership provides immense benefits to the community, although it does not always provide support for necessary repairs and upgrades. When a repair is needed, the senior and youth programs need to report the repair and obtain a ticket number through NYCHA's standard tenant repair structure. The response to such repair requests is often slow. The slow response is troubling for the individuals and families who live in NYCHA housing and is exacerbated when there are hundreds of individuals relying in community centers. Recently, our team needed to file three NYCHA repair tickets for a bathroom stall door that fell off the hinges. Our team needed to file three tickets because the repair system closed the first two tickets without notice of resolution, without notice or resolution. We understand that the ticketing system is meant to ensure accountability and transparency, but the system needs to be updated so tickets are not closed arbitrarily and repairs are able to be resolved within a timely manner. We also advocate for the local NYCHA office to be empowered to resolve small issues in a timely manner, such as bathrooms, stall doors, or broken locks. A challenge for our team is maintaining our high standards of service while working within the NYCHA repair and maintenance system and waiting for each ticket to be res uh, resolved. We're responsible for the care of the community room during our hours of operation and we continue to be held accountable for issues that are in the NYCHA ticketing system and have not yet been repaired, such as the bathroom stall door, or air ventilation. I, uh, I add um, also the Latimer, Latimer Gardens also faces a uh, place of assembly issue that's beyond our control but for which we can be held accountable. Latimer Gardens Community Center operated without functional air conditioning, heat, or air ventilation from late August through November 2018. We're deeply grateful for the assistance from Councilmember Ku's office and DIFTA to resolve this issue this week. 
Unfortunately, you had to operate throughout hot summer days and cold winter weather without adequate temperature control in the senior center. Recently, 20 members of our Chinese opera group and ping pong group had relocated to another space within the center or stopped coming because of lack of heat. We were concerned that if we continued to have cold rooms, we would be unable to meet the needs of the seniors in the Latimer Gardens community. We are grateful that the issue has been resolved and our center can continue to provide high quality programming with adequate heat. We suggest there be some channel created between DIFTA, NYCHA, DYCD, and other partner city agencies to more quickly address the communal repair needs within NYCHA buildings. The community space is shared among the senior center, DYCD's contracted after school program, and the Residents Association. Given the regular use of the space, we have found that the level of custodial care provided by NYCHA is not sufficient. Recently, the community center was used as a voting site for election day, so the senior center was closed. The following day, our senior center staff and program maintenance staff were responsible for cleaning the community center so our programs could function properly. We advocate for additional funding to accommodate custodial needs within the community center. Um, security. In New York City, security is an important issue, especially at programs serving vulnerable populations. Our senior center is open to all older community members, and we strive to create a safe and welcoming environment for all. Currently, there's very limited access to funding for additional cameras or security guards, which would allow our director to have oversight of who is coming and going. Recently, there was an attempted break-in in our office door and within our kitchen. Our team works closely with local police to report issues as they arise. We're grateful for Councilmember Ku's past investment in security in the residential areas of Latimer Gardens and advocate for additional funding to make cameras and security systems available for the community center. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the 20,000 clients we serve. I'm grateful for the Council's support on so many important programs. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, providing me the opportunity to testify. Um, hopefully it's not for me. Won't need five minutes, but I, I appreciate it. Um, so real quickly, I just want to review um, our situation down in Gowanus. So our situation is a little different. So uh, Gowanus Houses currently has a senior center, but doesn't have a community center. The uh, community center was shuttered upwards of 10 years ago. And so uh, the Guanas Neighborhood Coalition for Justice, which was formed around uh, a particular number of issues that are being um, advocated for around the uh, neighborhood zone that's being planned for next year, uh, we made it a point to try to reopen the center, A, because we've seen the use of that space, uh, especially in the impact of Hurricane Sandy, which uh, took a number of our buildings offline, and we used that space as a, um, a hub to uh, re uh, organized resources for residents. And so at this point, uh, we've, it's now been about five years where we've tried to engage different processes through uh, Council Member Levin's office, through discretionary funding. Uh, we've used uh, participatory budgeting to win money to reopen, reopen the center successfully. We actually uh, won about between two different cycles, close to half a million dollars. Uh, but we're seeing that uh, there is not only the issue that NYCHA doesn't have a, a clear capital budget for its centers, um, that, you know, in our, in our particular sense, a community that's, you know, literally a few hundred feet from the Guans Canal, which is extremely uh, polluted body of water, there isn't any clear uh, emergency preparedness planning uh, protocol for NYCHA in general, but specifically in our communities that were impacted by Hurricane Sandy or just at risk for additional uh, climate disasters. And so we're asking not, not only for, uh, I guess, the support in reopening uh, the community center to be intergenerational, in addition to uh, the repairs that are necessary at that space, which are approximately $4 million at this point. Um, we also want to make sure that you all are, are aware that the uh, mayor actually promised us last year at a uh, town hall uh, that was hosted by Council Member Levin that he, he would reopen the center. And so we're just hoping that uh, you can assist in uh, upholding that promise and that we create the space for you know a number of different processes that are happening. So uh, you have the Guans uh, Canal Superfund that's literally uh, you know half a block away from that center. Uh, we have you know conversations around the rezoning, and so we need the space to have a community hub to have um, those very important dialogues. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for being here. We will definitely work together with your council member um, to make sure that the mayor keeps his promise. 
Um, we all know how wonderful community centers are in our community, especially the one that are servicing our youth and our seniors. Uh, so, and we know that they need the repairs. And the frustration is that once council member allocate funding, it just sit there yeah. for years after year. Mm -hmm. And so we need to really expedite um, that process. And thank you to Self Help, I mean, for all the services that uh, you provide. And I'm glad that you have a close working relationship with your council member and you get the help that you need. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here today. Take care. Anyone else that want to testify that uh, can fill out form? Well, if not, um, thank you all for being here today. We have a wonderful hearing and we have a lot to follow up on. And it's such an honor to co-chair this hearing today with Council Member Abriel Samuel. And uh, we're gonna work closely together and to make sure that our public housing uh, resident um, get the best services that they deserve in our centers, in our, especially in our senior center. So we have a lot of follow up to do. And thank you again and happy holidays. Thank you, everyone, and we're going to look forward to a, a very intense and aggressive budget season, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>